I think we'll get started here. Um, my thought on today's session, which will be the first of two that I'm planning to, to use to review for the final exam, uh, was by default to go through some general comments um, on what you might expect on the exam and what you might not, what, what you can rule out needing to worry about being on the exam. Uh, now, following that, my thought was to field questions uh, by default. Um, if there are particular questions you'd like to ask, either about uh, contents of the, of the exam or um, you know, substantive questions on uh, specific concrete material, I'm glad to answer them then. Um, when those questions uh, are discharged, my thought was to then um, go through a set of slides, which I have pulled together um, with some care, which systematically go through a set of topics that we've covered within the semester. And they go through the large majority of said topics. Um, and uh, for each such topic, lay out what I consider the most salient, testable, uh, important uh, features of that section of the course. I have quite a few of those slides. They are substantive, detailed, and um, and my thought was to, following any you know early questions, to go through them. And uh, then in a second phase of questioning, um, I could uh, you know, answer uh, additional, additional questions then. When I'm going through the, um, the different sections germane to areas of the course, uh, I would also welcome you know, being stopped and asked questions about those. The goal is to kind of do a whirlwind tour through the most important elements and examinable elements uh, of this course. And if there are questions you know, about any particular one, either you know, what are we subject to in the exam about that, or I don't understand that concept, we should bring that up. I'll try to pause, but I'd also suggest people shout out you know, at that point to, to identify, um, identify questions rather than allowing me to kind of blather on. So that, that was my thought. Um, any uh, strong preferences for things we should cover before I talk in you know, just one or two slides about what you might expect and uh, rule out expecting on the exam? OK. Hearing uh, no comments on that, um, I will then switch to my uh, screen and we'll get going on, on these. Um, so again, my point here is just to cover two, two or so slides on the, um, the expectations for the exam. So uh, the exam structure is not yet complete. I'm actually joining you from holiday. Uh, I, I'm on a holiday till a week from today, um, but I've made an exception uh, for, for this, uh, this event. Um, and uh, I am still finalizing the structure of the, the exam. Uh, it, it will not be finalized uh, until shortly before the exam, in, in particular um, when I return. Uh, but there's a lot of features that are completely clear at this point. Um, and I've articulated some of the main ones there. It is closed book. Um, there's going to be a set of short answer questions. These would be things like true, false, uh, potentially you know, fill in the blank, uh, potentially some involving multiple choice, um, occasionally some which which might involve you know a, a very small calculation and and, and filling in an answer. Um, we've seen these sort of things on pop quizzes, right? If 
if there's an agent subject to a, a, a rate transition or hazard rate or a rate associated with a flow out which they can flow with a certain probability per unit time of leaving, what's the average time they spend in the stock or state, right? That sort of thing. Um, those are short answer questions. Um, medium length questions, you've also seen to a somewhat lesser degree, but, but still on quite a few occasions uh, within the pop quizzes. Here, what I'm looking for is sort of one to four sentences and it's typically, you know, uh, one to three, um, which basically ask you to, to demonstrate your knowledge of a certain, uh, certain set of material. And, you know, I may ask you um, to, for example, compare and contrast um, handling how, how um, models uh, that are aggregate system dynamics models or agent-based models scale um, as one uh, increases uh, population size. And I, I'd expect to, you know, you'd be able to comment on that. Or as you increase heterogeneity, um, the number of attributes um, that each person in the population um, needs to be associated with in the model. Um, so those, those sort of medium length questions, you might be expected to kind of uh, demonstrate your knowledge of, um, of some particular aspect of, of the situation. Maybe, maybe it's, um, you know, list two major types of equilibria that are uh, frequently present within infectious disease models. And I'm expecting there disease-free and endemic equilibria or something like that, um, you know, describe it. Uh, so those are medium length questions. There'll be many of those. Um, and then there's gonna be some longer questions. Uh, longer questions are expected to carry more points uh, and they're expected to take more time. Whether they carry more points per unit time is not up to me, but up to you. Um, and these questions can involve and should be expected to involve uh, some, ma some uh, mathematical, uh, mathematical solving um, or a little bit of, uh, of code potentially, but um, they would do so within certain limits. Uh, and I'll, I'll comment on things that won't be tested in the next slide. These longer questions um, would be expected to demonstrate a certain um, skill with uh, tasks that you might, might be um, expected to have built up in the course of the semester. Maybe it's taking a system dynamics model whose structure and flow equations uh, are shown to you and ask you to turn it into a set of, of differential equations. So you have a rate of change of S and a rate of change equals something and a rate of change of I equals something, a rate of change of R equals something. Um, for example, that, that might be a, a long form question. Um, so you're writing, writing that down. Uh, the exam is conducted electronically, will be conducted via Moodle. And there's a certain amount of mathematical sort of chops that it has. You can, you can encode some things in mathematics in Moodle. Um, if that's expected, I'll give you guidance how to do it, but it's really designed to to spare you time um, or to give give you time. And uh, you, you shouldn't, it, it's, not a, it's not a required thing, um, but it kind of prettifies the answer um, if you'd like to use it. So these longer questions uh, will be fewer in number, but will carry collectively a fair number of points. Um, 
they'll be going over types of challenges that we have gone through in class and and worked through. So uh, I would expect I would expect some um, some facility with that. Okay, so those are longer questions. Let's talk what's outside the scope. Um, so I am not going to ask you to create any working any logic model. I'm not going to ask questions which depend on memorization of any logic API. You know, what's the order for of parameters when you call move to or something like that? Um, what is um, what is the way in which one, you know, adds to a data set or anything like that? Not, nothing like that. Um, in general, I try to minimize that. Now, I, I might, and I want to refine this a little bit more. Uh, what is fair game there is like, um, I might ask you to demonstrate your knowledge of um, common network types. And I, I might note that these network types are represented in any logic, uh, which, which maybe would help you reflect back and remember. But I'm, I'm not asking them because I'm asking you to demonstrate knowledge of any logic. It's more, they, they were things you worked with at any logic um, at one point or another, particularly if you pursued the, um, the assignments. So uh, that might be an example or, you know, something kind of on the edge here is, is types of uh, transitions among state charts and, and any logic has, shall I name them, uh, you know, a timeout transition, which is basically a fixed time after entering a state, a rate transition, which is a hazard rate, a chance per unit time of leaving. It has a message transition, which brings someone out when they receive a message that matches some criteria. It also has conditional transitions out, which where a, an agent transitions out when a certain condition is realized. Um, and finally, there's an arrival transition. Now, um, my goal in asking these is not to, again, test your knowledge of any logic, but it's rather these are exemplars of, these are kind of indicative of common agent-based modeling primitives that any logic happens to capture and capture reasonably well. But um, I'm, I'm not intending to ask you you know, what do I have to click on in order to see this thing? Or to, you know, it's like I'm trying to minimize your needing to know any logic and really getting at the core concepts that often any logic captures, uh, but the goal is to not spew out knowledge of any logic. So that's a little bit of a subtlety that um, I was asked about the other day by a, a student. Um, about how much of it is on any logic. And when I answer that, I have to sort of couch my answer in, in, that, um, in that term. Uh, I'm not gonna ask you to calculate eigenvalues. I would expect you to know why they're at least a little bit relevant to some of the material covered in this class. Um, eigenvalues are very relevant um, in the context of stability of equilibria in the context of knowing that if someone flies in on a plane with COVID-19 into the Saskatoon airport, could we expect an outbreak uh, from that? Or does our health system have it under such control that it's gonna peter out? Maybe they'll infect one or two people, but it, will, it basically won't spread across the population. And eigenvalues uh, give you the insight into that. If you go back and listen to my lecture, if, if you don't re recall it um, uh, at the moment. So um, I'd, I'd like you to know their relevance and how if you were to be given a set of eigenvalues, you'd know is it stable or not. But I, I certainly don't expect you to do matrix inversion or calculate eigenvalues or anything, you know, really, really 
hairy like that. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. And I'm certainly not going to be asking you to do, you know, really, really complex mathematical calculations. So you don't have to be asked to take the square root or, you know, whatever. Um, no, that's outside the scope. Um, I'm, I'm further not planning to ask you really detailed questions in the COVID-19 lectures. Um, there's a, the particle filtering approach that I introduced, that I, I mentioned, you know, the important takeaway there is you can combine in some pretty interesting ways, dynamic models, in that case, aggregate system dynamics models with machine learning methods. And you can do it to kind of get some consensus picture in that case of kind of what's going on under the, you know, out there in the world in a way that meshes both theory as captured by the model and arriving data over time. This data that's unfolding over time is, you know, different numbers of cases are observed and different numbers of hospitalizations. And, you know, as ICUs fill up and, and tests are performed to different quantities and people are vaccinated, it sort of regrounds this model in that and sort of corrects the model's expectations. You should remember that much, at least. But um, I'm not asking you to sort of tell me about the likelihood functions of that model. Um, yeah, no, I want you to get the, the basic gist of it. Remember the, the weather model analogy, it's always updated, et cetera. Um, so I want you to take away some of the gist of it. Um, similarly, for the agent-based model that was presented, those who are paying closer close attention may remember it had, you know, workplaces and schools and long-term care facilities and hospitals, acute acute care facilities, uh, and you know, people and communities and a variety of other structures. Um, but I'm not going to, you know, ask you real detailed questions about that. Um, uh, you should know. It, is a agent-based model and it in fact is a hybrid agent-based model and includes discrete events simulation to represent things like contact tracing and lab processes and people waiting uh, within a hospital for testing or care or what have you. Um, so you, you should remember kind of that, that much of it, um, but uh, you don't, you don't need to, you know, remember details. Um, okay, so so those are some comments on sort of general structure of the exam and and what things are outside model scope to to set expectations. Um, now I have a set of topics, and I told you I have a lot of slides uh, to go through systematically on the major topics we discussed in this class. But before so doing, with you informed that I will be doing this, um, which may, you know, decide for some of you that you want to defer your question till after that, um, I, I would field questions right now from any students, uh, things you'd like to ask about the exam format or things that uh, you're not sure if you're subject to them at the exam uh, or, um, you know, things you're really confused about substantively and you'd like me to specifically address before I go into this kind of survey systematically of the material. So I open the floor uh, to, to discussion uh, right now. Any things you would like to, to ask me right now? Make sure I'm not missing anything in the chat here. Yeah, it will be up. It, it will be uploaded. Um, so, question from Spencer: the recording will be uploaded. So, um, I'll be I'll do that afterwards. It is currently recording. Okay. If people want me to stop the recording for a question, I'm happy 
to obliged. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to do that for confidentiality of student questions. So just just let me know. Well, I have a question. Good. Okay. Um, maybe what I will do then is, I, I think I think just so every student can be sure that you know they don't they don't get their voice out on the internet. I'm going to pause and we'll res I will resume uh, and we will jump in to the material. Um, uh, the lectures, uh, good question. Lectures on sensitive analysis and calibration are fair game and I have material uh, about them that I'm about to show. Now, just so you're aware, um, I actually can't see the chat window when I'm presenting my screen. Uh, I don't know if it's a Linux, Linux Zoom thing or if it's typical, but um, uh, I have trouble. Uh, I, I'm not gonna be able to, to see if a message has been posted in short. Um, and uh, so I, I will need people to speak up if possible. I'm gonna uh, frob my uh, my phone here in hopes that I can join via phone, uh, in, which would allow me to see the chat. And but please, 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 please speak up, okay? So bum bum bum. Okay, so I um, I am currently uh, on uh, as a participant as well. So hopefully I'll see chat messages, but please be encouraged to speak up. Okay, so let's talk about broad uh, topics. This was going to be one and two, but I decided to kind of re, re, refactor it. So here we go. Um, so these are some model, some major topics discussed. This is um, less well thought through than I that I, I would like, but um, I spent a lot of my time sort of collecting things for different sections on many of these. So we talked, look, we talked about mid modeling motivations and philosophy, the process and scope associated with modeling. This is really kind of conceptualization of models. Um, and we'll, I'll remind you of that process and some of the principles that I emphasize that I do want you to carry away. Okay. Um, we talked about uh, dynamic modeling methodologies. We talked about system dynamics with an emphasis on aggregate system dynamics, agent-based modeling, discrete event simulation, hybrid modeling, and then some, the trade-offs and interactions between them. Uh, we further spoke about some aspects of networks, um, types of networks, and we had a particular lecture specifically on scale-free networks, which are of great practical and theoretic interest and which reflect, which are seen in many computer networks as well as human, human networks, uh, many aspects of human behavior. We talked about uh, feedbacks in the context of system dynamics and formal model analysis, using system dynamics models, but particularly it was in the context of infectious disease modeling. Um, we, we talked about, uh, the choice of these methods. It's, I say metalinguistic abstraction. I mean, really I'm talking about sort of trade-offs between these dynamic remodeling methodologies, but it's basically choosing the methodologies. Um, we talked about nonlinearity and, and its role in infectious disease modeling. The fact you need both susceptibles and infected for someone to get in, infected is a sign that it depends non-linearly on these things. It's not merely double the number of susceptibles, you know, you'll get double the number of people getting infected. No, you, in order to know, um, you know, how many people are infected, you need to know the number of infectives as well. And, uh, and this is an important, important, um, important for many reasons. Uh, calibration sensitivity analysis, we also talked about and we talked about, um, this is incorrect. So, you know, this was really glimpse of particle filtering. Um, and uh, formally uh, state space, not state space reconstruction. That's a deeper topic we won't get into, but it's really cool. 
Um, okay. Stop. State, state. No, that's not what we want. State, space. Okay. There we go. Boom. There we go. Okay. Um, so these are some major uh, topics. Um, my thought was to jump in, but I want to field any questions right now because you may say, I don't see X there. Is that because he doesn't think it's important? He considers it a minor part of the course, or is it just because he didn't happen to capture a doubt? So I want to ask, anyone want to ask questions like about something you say, hey, where is it? It's not there. Want to ask about that? Or want to ask, uh, so, so I said any logic mechanism. So I'm going to, I'm going to sort of, I, I gave my, my, my uh, sort of spiel about that earlier. Okay. Any questions about things that you don't see on here or you're wondering why and if it's significant, you're not seeing it? What about uh, determining equilibrium and looking around equilibria? I felt like we yeah. spent a lot of time talking about yeah. that. That's this. That's this right there. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, so but, sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 what I meant meant by that. But um, it's it's a great example of how you know questions good for clarifying, like unpacking what do I mean by that opaque term. Formal model analysis. I'm saying like you. You, you formally go and uh, solve for the equilibria, or you um, work to to determine what is the even the the value of the basic reproductive number for a model, or the um, you know uh, what is the um, what it, you know write down the force of infection for this model. Um, uh, actually, I wouldn't, I'm not sure I'd call that analysis, but it, it sort of verges up against it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, great question. Other question? Going once, going twice, gone. Okay, so um, we will plow on. Okay, um, so uh, let's talk about system dynamics. So basically, for for most of these, I'm going to tell you what I consider the most important things. Are, okay, and it's possible I've forgotten you know, a small number, but but these are the ones foremost in my mind now. And as I'm finalizing the exam, these are gonna be the ones foremost in my mind. So you can bet that what I'm talking about now is a pretty good indication of a lot of things that have a excellent chance of appearing on the exam. May not be exhaustive, but it's pretty darn good. Okay, so system dynamics. I expect you to know the building blocks, stocks and flows. I expect you to be able to know for a given quantity. Like, like if I say, you know, um, consider uh, the amount of money in a bank account. Um, if you were to construct a system dynamics model uh, concerning dynamics of your bank account, would this represent a stock or a flow? Or, you know, or conversely, where would your income, would that be a flow or a stock? The, the, Answers I'm expecting there are first one stock, bank account balance is a stock, and the income, it's a thing per unit time. Hundred thousand dollars saying I have an income of a hundred thousand dollars has a lot of different implications if it's per minute versus per year, and that's a dead giveaway. It's a flow. Um, it's per unit time. Uh, I'd expect you'd be able to kind of recognize what's What's the stock here? What's the flow? Um, uh, so stocks and flows um, have dynamics associated with them. And stocks, um, their dynamics depends on the values of the flows um, into and out of them. But specifically, the rate of change of a stock 
is dependent on the net flow, flow in minus some of the flows in minus some of the flows out. I think that determines how quickly it's rising or falling. If the flows in equal the flows out, it's going to be staying the same. If the flows in are greater than the flows out, it's going to be rising over time. If the flows out are greater than the flows in, it's going to be falling over time. Um, so the stock dynamic depends on the flows, and and uh, you should be aware of this. Um, so rates of change. We're dealing with rates of change here, here, and here, and um, I do expect. Gosh, um, yeah, it, it's kind of down here. You to have some comfort in taking a depiction of a model, and you know where maybe formulas are specified, and um, and unpacking it to ODEs. Uh, so, in other words, to, to unpack into that s dot i dot r dot, which are those s dot means the rate of change of s. How quickly it's rising. Is it going up five people per day? It's getting, you know, the number of people are susceptible is, is increasing by five people per day. Um, is it falling by five people per day, et cetera? Um, same thing for infectives. So I want you to be able to, to do that unpacking. And, you know, I have some nice pictures of that later. We, we will go and look at. Um, uh, okay, um, additional things there. There's this dimensionality that I, I talked about. And actually, I will ask you to watch a lecture on it at one point, a video. Um, or look, if, if we have a stock who's, which is of dimension or unit, um, let's say people, um, individual you know, counts of people, then the flows into it have to be people per unit time. The flows out of it have to be people per unit time has to be that way. Um, there's this dimensional consistency that needs to be maintained um, because over time that flow in is going to be accumulating in the stock, you know, some amount of time, time times the value of that flow. So if you multiply a time times uh, people per unit time, you should get, you know, the dimension of the stock people. Um, and uh, I do expect knowledge of that. Um, uh, hazard rates, we, we talked about hazard rates. I actually had a little bit of a, an example on this where we um, were sort of reasoning about a chance per unit time, probability per unit time, say, of leaving the stock. Um, and that is a, a continuous, you know, a continuous sort of the uh, continuous probability of sorts, it's probability per unit time. It's a what we call a probability density or hazard rate. And um, it, it reflect the fact that, you know, it could go on at any point during this time. And, you know, I'd kind of like you to have some familiarity with that, but most importantly, at a practical level, I expect you have a hazard rate of alpha of leaving a stock. You're, and that's the only thing out flowing out of the stock. You have a, a time in the stock on average of one over alpha. We talked about first order delays quite a bit um, and I have some slides in them. Talked about competing risks a bit. So if there's two flows out, one out going out with rate alpha, another rate with beta, no longer is it true your average amount of time before leaving with alpha is just one over alpha because you could leave via beta. And if beta is really, really big, the only people who are gonna be living by alpha, leaving by alpha are people who leave quickly. And so it's gonna kind of move people on average to leave earlier. Um, the fact that there's this other flow out. Um, we talked about aging chains that often we have these first order delays. They're kind of bolted together in succession. And you have a second order delay and a third order delay. And it changes the shape of the, the flow out um, uh, associated with that. Um, okay, so, uh, Let's see, a few other things. We talked, there, there's this numerical integration that you have to typically it's solved by going through step by step um, with some time steps, small time steps. Um, there's a bit of subtlety there, but I won't go into, but uh, you could think of it for the sake of this course as being fixed time steps. 
and um, you're totaling up how many people leave and come in to these talks uh, through that. And the problem is that those time steps have to be small enough that you're not going to make any silly mistakes. Um, and you'll have a stock go negative of people or something non-physical like that. So there's this thing called numeric integration where you're kind of solving what's going on over time. And, and you need a small enough delta T. You need a small enough sort of look at what's going on over time to not uh, not get caught up in, uh, in silly things like it goes negative. Uh, we talked about feedbacks, balancing and reinforcing. Um, they go by the name, of course, respectively negative and positive. And we talked about how that structure induces dynamics. Um, reinforcing feedbacks lead to a kind of an unstable dynamic. They have an eigenvalue of greater than one, greater than zero. It was a real part of greater than zero, and it leads to this kind of escalating dynamic. It's this, it, it it catches. You know, it's like, you know, each infective infects two people, and it goes from one to two to four to eight to sixteen, and so on. Uh, number of people who are infected. It just multiplies, and each of them infects others, and it 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 just gets out of hand. That's a reinforcing feedback. Um, a balancing feedback be something like you know you get hungry and you go and eat something you become less hungry for example um, or there's more people who are susceptible and because there's more susceptibles there tends to be more in, in, in mixing with infectives and for a given number of infectives there'll be more more um, infections and that will drain the number of uh, susceptible. So it's kind of self-limiting or that's not quite the right word for it, but it, you know, increasing it tends to push back harder and harder on it. It's kind of like a rubber band you stretch and it pulls back. Um, and that's associated with, uh, with stability and something that approaches some equilibrium value. And we kind of played around with that in a modeling class at one point. Um, you should be aware that there are these things called causal loop diagrams or CLDs. Uh, I did not teach them in this course because of lack of time. Uh, there's all qualitative side to system dynamics that uh, we didn't have time to explore. But um, uh, you should be aware that they exist and they um, illustrate uh, visually the um, connections between parameters, or excuse me, between variables within the system and uh, feedbacks. They're, they're particularly feedback centric. System dynamics in general is focused on feedbacks and accumulation. Um, but system dynamics traditionally seeks to emphasize changing people's mental models. Uh, it's not just about building a model that's great and you can use to, to answer your questions. It's about getting people to think differently about the situation. And this is one of its kind of hallmarks that goes back decades. Um, and so it really emphasizes often simpler visual models that are parsable by decision makers and where you can build intuitions on their part um, so that they can make better decisions day to day, uh, not merely depending on a model to you know, guide them. Um, that's a quite distinctive kind of feature of system dynamics. Uh, it is traditionally deterministic. Um, there's certainly no shortage of people, including your lecturer, who, is, who have um, uh, experimented with, you know, done lots of work with stochastic models. But by and large, it's overwhelmingly deterministic tradition. Um, that stands in contrast to the other two traditions uh, that we, we covered in the course. Um, we talked about equilibria and solving for their location and how one would determine stability without expecting you to actually go through the whole the whole exercise. Um, and I noted that system dynamics simulation run times, how long it takes to run a simulation model is invariant to the population. The population is, is the, the way in which it factors into model execution is just for each stock, how big is it? You know, how, what's the size of the number? Just because you have 
you know, a million people in the stock versus a thousand, it's not going to run any slower. Um, so it's, it's, you know, invariant to the population size, but it depends strongly on heterogeneity. So if you need to have a model that now needs to keep track of COVID-19 infections separately in men and women, or separately in Regina and Saskatoon and the rest of the province, um, suddenly you've grown the model by a factor of the, the number of those categories, and it's gonna take that much longer to simulate. And it tends to be both awkward and time consuming and more space consuming as a result. So that's system dynamics modeling, uh, aggregate system dynamics modeling. Any questions people would like to ask about that? Those are some whirlwind things about it that I consider most relevant. Any question? Three, two, one. No? Yeah, I, I got one question. Good, good. Yes. Uh, I, just, I just wonder uh, what you expect us to know about the simulation runtime. That it depends a lot on heterogeneity and not on population size, that if you double the population size, it doesn't lead to any increase in simulation runtime, for example. Those would be the things I'd expect you to know um you know that it tends to tends to be invariant of it doesn't depend on the population size for example is, is very important okay i see thank yeah. you yeah yeah and you know another thing there you again had took a COVID 19 model for the whole province and you were asked to simulate it now for seven regions of the province as i've done um you know now it's going to require typically seven times the runtime and seven times the amount of space that it takes um even putting aside the software engineering of it which will make it a lot more messy but um or somewhat more messy so so th that's an example it tends to rise linearly now i'm putting aside optimization and those of you familiar with systems level issues will know there's parallelization opportunities potentially and and good things like that. But, um, you know, naively speaking, it'll rise with the number of, uh, uh, if you are going to disaggregate it by one attribute, it'll go, go up with the number of values of the attribute. If you have to disaggregate it with respect to multiple attributes or say static attributes, or maybe you want to capture COVID-19 for, you know, uh, uh, infection status and, you know, flu infection status, um, uh, then you've got to consider all possible combinations. There's this combinatorial blow up. Maybe COVID-19, you could be one of 10 different states and flu, you could be one of four different states. And you've got like 40 categories you got to deal with because four times 10, every possible combination of them, every state of one and match with the other state of the other because I could be infected with flu and in late stage COVID-19, I could be infected with flu and not yet infected by COVID-19, I could be infected by flu and you know, blah, blah, blah. So all possible combinations. I'd expect you to know that. Good question. Other question? Other questions on SysMyNamic? I uh, see there's a chat. Okay. Oh, okay. Let me somehow is, uh, where's my Zoom? Wait, get over here. Um, somehow I got kicked off of Zoom. Um, okay. Uh, oh, unfortunately the chat uh, mumble. Um, okay. Let's go see if, oh, look at that. Oh my gosh. Okay. Zoom is broken on Linux. Okay. Um, uh, there's some weird dynamics going on. Okay, so questions. Yeah, has the lecture from April 6th been uploaded? Um, uh, what is the April 6th lecture on? I can actually see the chat right now at the cost of this box being sitting here. What's the April 6th lecture? Can anyone say? 
if it hasn't, I could do so. Uh, oh, Cephalabm model. No, that's not Ben. Uh, let me ask the guest lecturers just to get from. Um, uh, but I think we could probably get that up quite quickly. I did ask them if they'd be okay with it. And they said earlier, I just want to be sure post, post lecture. Thanks for, for asking. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions right now? Okay. So, angel based modeling. Um, angel based modeling, in contrast to the sort of the hedgehog knowledge of system dynamics, the small number of building blocks that it combines in creative ways to to, to understand the interaction of stocks and flows, how it gives rise to merchant patterns. Agent-based modeling has lots of building blocks. You have events and you have state charts and you have variables used within those state charts. You have statistics calculated over the population. You have messages, you know, many, many different types of these sort of building blocks you use. Um, Agent-based modeling answers different questions in system dynamics. Uh, Agent-based modeling is really focused on agent-agent -agent interaction and how that induces higher level behavior as well as agent environment bidirectional interaction. Think an agent getting infected by aerosols in the environment and in turn, you know, uh, shutting them, um, for example. Um, Agent-based modeling has this uh, in contrast to, to system dynamics modeling, where heterogeneity is kind of a sore point, um, you have to be really careful adding heterogeneity in and deal with multiple spheres of progression, you know, along COVID-19, along influenza, along, you know, diabetes, uh, along chronic kidney disease, whatever. That's such a headache in, in aggregate system dynamics models because of combinatorial explosion. You have to consider all possible combinations here, it's, it's um, very straightforward to do. So straightforward to do that you have to be cautious about doing it too glibly, too, too sort of uh, casually. Um, you can very readily represent static heterogeneity. You can represent individual trajectories of individuals over time in ways that are not possible to capture in system dynamics. You can, you can actually take data about the world from the world about you know, people's care journeys or about the number of times different people have been, in, been infected with COVID-19. Um, yeah, we're getting to that time where it's very, very readily possible, particularly with some of these variants like the P1 from Brazil or b 1351 from South Africa, you can get reinfected uh, fairly readily. And over time, five years from now, there's gonna be many people who've gotten infected more than once with COVID-19. Um, and, uh, and you know, we can reason about that within our agent-based model, keep track for each person of their history and compare it to real world histories um, and statistics from real world history. There's no way we could do that in system dynamics for any non-trivial thing. I mean, about the best we can do is sort of keep track dichotomously, you know, was this person born macrosomic or not, or something like that, or born in this weight class, that one or that one, for a small number of categories. Agent-based modeling has this ability to represent continuous heterogeneity too. You know, what was my birth weight as a real number, well, rational number, um, whereas system dynamics, you kind of chunk things up into categories and you'd better not have too many of those categories that are gonna blow up when you, multi when you consider all combinations. So agent-based modeling has this real forte for representing um, heterogeneity, uh, but it has a high runtime dependence on population. You double the population size with today's sadly primitive um, implementations of agent-based modeling, you basically double the runtime. It needn't be so given the localized nature of interagent interactions. There's plenty of parallelization opportunities, but today's tools are primitive um, and don't really effectively exploit that. So in general, you double the population size, you double the runtime, double the memory requirements. Um, and sometimes it's more than double because you 
start hitting virtual memory effects, memory hierarchy issues, or you have a network that's really dense and that goes up with super linearly. You know, you double it and it goes up by more than double uh, because you have a very, very dense network that has to be kept, keep track of who's connected with who in almost a n squared sort of way. Um, tends not to be that common, but but it can happen. Um, uh, so agent-based modeling um, tends to put this emphasis on, on representing agents as kind of having localized perception and interacting. They don't have this kind of God's eye view that you have in system dynamics where, you know, all across the model, you kind of see what's, what's going on. Individual agents are kind of placed in a certain position. Maybe it's a position in a network or a position in space. And they have very localized interaction of them. They're wired into certain agents, um, but not many others. Um, and um, they make decisions sometimes based on that, or they get infected by their neighbors, not by any old person in the population, as is the case in system dynamics, where this is kind of random mixing between different groups. And about the best you can do is break them down into compartments, this region of the province, that region, that region, keep them separate with only limited interactions in system dynamics. Here, it's, it's par for the course. You have agents situated in certain places. Um, there's a uh, much higher dimensional state space in agent-based modeling. It's looked at uh, nominally, it's state space is huge, right? You have, each agent can be in one of two states. Suddenly to encode the state of the whole model is like having a bit vector with the number of bits in that bit vector, one and zero for each position being equal to the number of agents. It goes up at, in, if they each have two possibilities, it's like two to the n possibilities, right? 10 agents, two to the 10th, or one or two, four possibilities. Um, and uh, we'll come back to this issue of, of state space in a few minutes. Um, uh, now, agent-based modeling, in contrast to, to the deterministic tradition in system dynamics, is traditionally is, is stochastics. Not every model we looked at had it. Uh, the game of life did not. That was deterministic. But most models are stochastic because individual level decision making behavior is often stochastic. Whether I happen to get infected by that person who was next to me on the escalator in Hudson Bay um, while I was doing my Christmas shopping is, is a matter of a little bit of chance. Um, so, uh, so we have stochastics and the way we deal with stochastics often is by ensembles of realizations. We run the model many, many, many times. And to, to avoid over-interpreting a fluke, you know, that just happened to get a certain response, we run it many times to take the average or, or look at the variability, et cetera. Um, and we find the broad regularities that hold despite the vagaries of chance, which lead to different particular outcomes. Um, we have a big emphasis on context, uh, spatial context, um, whether it's geographic or indoor, discrete versus continuous. Um, the university really wants to use our models for talking about university operations in coming months. Uh, uh, they discovered that it's a good thing in the university. And um, maybe we'll end up building a model of U of S. Um, to, to reason about infection spread within U of S and how to stem it off in the fall. Um, if anyone's interested in that, come speak with me. Um, uh, we could tie it in with wastewater sampling. Um, uh, in other cases, we have networks. We have structure and dynamics that are induced by networks. Um, so we have agents wired together in either static networks or dynamic networks. And there can be spread of influence, uh, pathogen, um, uh, et cetera, over these networks. We, within HMA's modeling, we have this really nice ability, which is not there in aggregate system dynamics to nest things, to kind of have one thing inside of another. Um, and you could have, you know, individuals and families and families within neighborhoods and neighborhoods within cities. And, and that allows you to kind of, uh, reason in a, in a crisp way about what's going on at the city level and the 
family level, at the level of the neighborhood, and compare it with statistics from the world. And it's just a very conceptually clean sort of composition, very natural and very useful for, uh, for practical sort of uh, characterization of what's going on. And that model of COVID-19 in, in um, the province makes heavy use of it. The one that's also in use by other jurisdictions. Um, now, uh, time in agent-based modeling comes in two forms. One is discrete time, where it's kind of things advance in lockstep at this time. All the agents update in ways that are conceptually independent. They don't, that agent be updating first in that little atomic fragment of time shouldn't influence the other agent, it should be atomic. It's like they're all in their previous state and then now they're all in their updated state. And it takes some choreography to make that happen properly, some resources often. Um, that's a discrete time sort of lockstep model. They all update and then they all update and then they all update and there's no notion of continuous time. That you just have these kind of discrete update events. Um, by contrast, there are these a very popular model a, a model of growing popular that any logic uses as its default to its credit is this discrete events in continuous time. The idea is things happen at their natural times. You don't force fit them all into one atomic operation that occurs in these kind of um, steps, time steps or, or, or ticks as they're sometimes called instead you have continuous time. Um, uh, we talked about state charts. State charts like stock and flow diagrams nicely capture three things. The, the, the states someone could be in, in this case, with respect to a particular concern, the actions that can change that state here, firing transitions over in system dynamics, it's flows. And then the rules that govern those actions. In system dynamics, it's, you know, the particular formulas associated with flows. In agent-based modeling, it's whether, well, if it's a rate transition, there's this semantics associated with it, this hazard rate. If it's a conditional transition, there's this semantics. If it's a message transition, there's this one. If, there's, if it's an arrival transition, it's that one. If it's a timeout, it's this other one. Um, so you have state, so state charts, like stock and flow diagrams each, simultaneously specify states, you can be um, the actions that can change those states and the rules under which those actions are fired and how much they're fired. Um, state charts, ladies and gentlemen, uh, are, are a very good building block and it's a higher level building block that for decades was absent from agent-based modeling and you had to sort of just hard code them up and you can bet a lot of models had state charts, but it was, it was just in the code. It wasn't reified as a thing. And reifying things as things that are natural constructs offers a lot of benefits, software engineering wise, clarity of understanding by stakeholders, optimization opportunities, lots of other, um, lots of other benefits. Uh, there's this message-based interaction between agents. That's standard in computer science when you have these decoupled actors that need to communicate and they're asynchronous. We, we use messages commonly. It's a, you'll, something you'll find a lot in distributed computing and it's a very elegant way of sidestepping issues with like uh, synchronization locks, et cetera. Um, and then I urge the use of an agile type approach within this context whereby agents, uh, whereby models are formulated in incremental fashion. Um, Will I be posting these notes to Moodles? Um, uh, you bet I will. Um, uh, yes, so I'll be, I'll be posting this to Moodle. So this is agent-based modeling. Before I go on to discrete event modeling, are there any questions related to this? By the way, I have lots of, uh, lots of stuff to expand on this coming up, but any questions on my utterances just then or, or questions on this material or what subject being, being asked or what? Questions?
Three, two, one. Anything final? Nothing. Okay. Let's talk about discrete event simulation. Okay, discrete event simulation um, has a different focus. Um, uh, it's focused on resource limited service delivery, typically. You have these structured workflows, you have these entities. It's also like agent based modeling, an individual level tradition. Um, make note of that. Um, you have these resources um, and progress of a given, so it's entities that flow down a workflow, um, flow down one of these services. And for them to progress at different points, typically they need recourse to services. And uh, commonly you, you distinguish three types of services. I didn't put it down, or excuse me, three types of resources. So you have some with agency, mobile they're called in any logic, but they have agency, um, they can, move around kind of on their own. There's things that are portable, but can't move around on their own. Think like a portable ultrasound machine or a EKG machine or a, a wheelchair or something like that, a, a, a bed. Um, uh, and then there's things that are fixed, you know, that, that don't move like an x-ray machine or an MRI or a you know, an operating theater or something like that. Um, and, and those are different types of resources that may be needed. And entities try to proceed down this workflow, but, if, but at certain points they need these resources. And if those resources are not currently available, they will wait. They will be queued up and await availability of resources. And there are preemption options typically and there's balking options. Preemption would be like this higher priority, you know, agent comes in, there's been someone in a car crash who comes in. If you've been in the ER, you may have seen this, you're waiting, you've been triaged in the ER and there's other people coming by who may be in worse shape than you and they may be seen before you. Part of being triaged is you're kind of given a acuteness score. It's actually called the CTAS score, Canadian, um, triage uh, acuteness score. And um, being assigned that acuteness score, you, you're gonna wait different lengths of time and, and people come in before you. There's also typically balking, that's an option um, where you, you might leave um, before you're getting seen, you say, you know, I'm out of here um, and, and you leave. Um, so uh, queuing is a big focus within these discrete event simulation models. And as we talked about in one of the last two pop quizzes, um, that's the major way in which entities interact here. Agent-based modeling is also an individual tradition and it really focuses on agent-agent interaction and agent-environment interaction. Discrete event simulation, it, it more focuses on the latter where the environment here is kind of the workflow and what resources are in use and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, major outcomes of this include waiting time, waiting queue length, uh, resource uh, utilization, um, and uh, throughput. How many entities can be serviced per day, can be delivered service per day. Um, I do expect you to know something about the building blocks. Uh, any logic, uh, captures these, but it's not about any logic per se. These are kind of familiar conceptual constructs like seizing a resource or being associated with it and moving around, uh, having it move around with the entity. Um, so I want you to know something about the operators there. Um, and we talked about those some in class. Uh, we, I, I'm not expecting you to know like, what's the exact name of the API call for these or or, or what have you, but I do expect you to, to kind of be able to, to, to characterize them at least functionally and hopefully by the agencies versus attach isn't too hard. There's kind of a move to uh, versus send to, which um, also has some distinctions you can read about it. Uh, there's this dichotomy here, this kind of asymmetry between entities and resources. It's entities who flow through this and in contrast to agent-based modeling where agents are more active and have agency, 
In discrete event simulation, entities are fairly passive. They're operated upon as they flow down. And then you have these resources who are not entities and sort of act on them. They're kind of the workers in the service um, that dispense their skills upon the people or offer them services. So it's kind of this dichotomy that there's really not an agent-based model. There is a certain amount of nesting that goes on in context of, of this kind of service environment, but the, the nesting is deeper and more flexible in agent-based model. Um, there's, oh, I said types of resources, and then there's movement. And commonly these are placed in, a, in an environment where people can move around. And it's more than eye candy. One thing to really emphasize here is, look, movement time is endogenized here. So the fact that, you know, the scope has to be taken from this, this location versus that one will have impacts on how long it takes for the nurse to go get that scope and for him to bring it back to the patient room, for example. And that's, that will, in turn, determine things like how quickly the patient that that nurse is seeing um, is examining uh, will be done um, their operation. So, uh, so this movement where things are and where one has to go for resources, how far you have to travel, um, that, that actually like can make the process more efficient or less efficient. So one of the areas of interest is often often you know optimizing the placement of resources to have it go as quickly as you know to have greatest throughput for example of agents being treated or what have you of entities being treated um there's often a spatial environment there's routing within that spatial environment okay this is discrete event simulation as a reminder any questions on this Okay, yeah, I will just note that one of our major forms of hybrid modeling we examined, one of those five compelling patterns, you had agents who sought care within structured workflows and there they're represented as entities. And any logic in recent versions has been working to kind of blur this distinction. So indeed it's seamless. So you can have agents kind of flow in and flow down discrete event where they're kind of more passive in this workflow, but they retain their agenthood as far as their relationship to the rest of the model. Just be aware of that, okay? And in the COVID-19 ABM, for example, resources are also agents in the model who have homes and who have kids in the school and uh, et cetera, and uh, may go to the farmer's market to, to buy food. Um, and, and they can be infected. So, um, so within any logics context, um, that's weaving together discrete event simulation, agent-based modeling can take place very naturally. And it's to that platform's credit. Okay. Any, again, any questions about this before I go on? Okay, we're um, just beyond the top of the hour. Um, so I will uh, continue on here. Um, continue to get reports on, on uh, COVID-19 happenings when I'm, when I'm doing this. Okay, now I've been logged out. Okay, this is bad news. I'm gonna have to go back in, boom. Um, okay, so, um, uh, hey, get back here, get back here. Okay, um, oh my gosh, okay, fine. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, um, let's talk about, so I'm kind of going through some other topics besides these types of, of simulation here. Let's talk about this issue of motivations, philosophy and essentials. So look, a, a central theme of this course has been the systems perspective. It, it,
it's the science of the whole, dealing with systems whose, whose behavior cannot merely be reduced to its parts. And again, this is one of the, the big discoveries of 20th century science, which is of course continued on and been furthered in the 21st century, that you know, there's a broad class of problems where we're not gonna be able to make huge progress by just taking it apart into its pieces and analyzing each piece and expecting somehow that that's going to give us great benefit by itself. We have to have some science of the whole. Some, so, so for every type of analysis, we need a synthesis. We need to be able to put those pieces together and reason about them. And there are these you know, diverse systems where the behavior of the whole is not merely reducible to its pieces. And knowing about each piece in isolation, it's not gonna tell you about the, the behavior of the whole. Just like knowing, getting a list of all the cars in the traffic jam and their axle type and their tire type and their engine type and you know the number of occupants in them and the age of the vehicle and the emissions per minute that are coming out of it. That does not gonna tell you about the traffic jam. It's not gonna tell you how to solve the traffic jam because it's not, not just about each car in isolation. It's about where they are and the circumstance for and the visibility and the weather and, and the curvature of the road and all that sort of stuff. So we have, we have this need for the science of the whole. And, and this is um, you know, something that um, is intensively required for the world's trickiest problems. Um, and it's needed to explain what's going on in the world to, to even know if data from the world supports some hypothesis where it's likely to go next, what's driving the patterns we see. Why is Michigan going crazy with, with cases and Ontario being brought to its knees, uh, whereas you know, Prince Edward Island is, is much less uh, badly hit. Um, why is uh, you know, British Columbia having a huge outbreak of P1 right now, um, et cetera. Uh, and the second need here in terms of understanding is, is how do we intervene? No, um, how do we intervene most effectively? How do we improve things? How do we bend the curve? Um, and you know, the fundamental reflection of system science is that look, um, when we see data from the world, it's, it's, it may be coming from different areas of a system, but it's what it's speaking about, what it's manifesting, what it's whispering of is, is the underlying processes operating within the system. This is just different faces of an underlying system. Um, and, and we have to grapple with this underlying system. And there's this philosophy called uh, critical realism that sort of uh, seeks at a philosophical level to, to articulate this and, and, and um, You'll find expositions in terms of things amazingly like modeling philosophy, where they were context mechanism and outcome. Um, but you know, here we're dealing with these tangled systems, and, and in order to reason about how to how to grapple with this and, and most effectively make decisions and improve things, we need to reason consistently about why these patterns are coming about, not treat them as just chance events that we're getting a certain number of cases per year time. To, to know how to improve the situation, we have to understand what's driving this. And, and to understand what's driving it, we need to reason about a very complicated system. And we need models to help us do that because models are, are these thinking prostheses. They help us think through, um, you know, think through uh, uh, our understanding of the system and challenge it. And, and again, it's not that our models are correct, but they help us more quickly identify mistakes in our thinking and in cases where we're off base. Um, and so they, you know, help us reason through consistently, put our theories about the, the external world or understandings how it might be to test by seeing if they hold water, if they hang together, if they really add up in ways that are consistent with the external evidence. And they, they allow us to sort of, by running that simulation, see is our understanding of how it might be consistent with what we see in the world. So we have these causal models and you know, these are mechanistic models we sometimes turn them. They, they have an abstraction, but, but they depict kind of the underlying physics of the system. And, 
that's posited to apply in the world. It's you know, plausibly believed that this is maybe how it is in the world. And they simulate whatever this tradition, which are all these traditions, step by step, the evolution, the state of the system. Um, and because this is, this has an attempt to depict the causal structure of the system, we can ask things like, well, what if we could really ramp up the amount of Pfizer vaccination taking place? Or, or what if we could double the number of contact tracers available in the province? Or what if we expanded our lab capacity so we could turn around genomic sampling um, uh, identification of variants within a short time? Or what if we had outbreak response immunization campaigns focused on a hard hit communities? And uh, I could go on and on, but um, uh, you're, you're not uh, the ministry, so I won't. Um, so there's this co-evolution, the mental model, which is so emphasized in, in system dynamics with the formal modeling. And the formal modeling is used to, you know, to, to, to generate simulated dynamics, which we compare against uh, that. And this arrow should be flipped around and go back to the mental model. It refines our mental model. We collect data from the world and experiment, you know, sort of observe the effects of interventions and use that to refine our thinking and about the models. So models are learning tools, so these prostheses. Let's talk about modeling process. Because modeling uh, takes place in a, in a set of stages, typically. And uh, you know we've spent a lot of our time talking about some of these later stages. But uh, early stages are often you know, the most important, just like creating requirements for a software, for a software product is one of the most important um, elements of, of uh, getting it delivered uh, effectively. Um, so it is that problem conceptualization and, and kind of mapping out a system roughly is, um, is, is really, really important for having a successful project. And one of the things I articulate in this class, uh, I don't want it to, to um, be missing from your understanding, is this division when we have a model between endogenous things, things that the model generates, the things the model tells us, exogenous things, which like endogenous things are represented in the model, but where we give pre-specified assumptions to use for these. The model's not generating it. We are telling the model what to assume here, whereas endogenous things, the model's telling us. For exogenous things, we're telling the model what to assume. It may be something over time, um, a time series of number of vaccines available on certain dates. Um, by contrast, we could have a model which simulates the vaccine supply chain and availability of vaccines, and that's endogenous, for example. Exogenous things can also frequently be specified as fixed constants. We assume this many vaccines per day or that amount of testing per day. And finally, there's things that are ignored or excluded okay, um, from the model altogether. Okay, now. Um, a few general principles. Um, typically, there's a high opportunity cost to investing in a given model area. So, you know, investing in A means we can't do B. So we have to be very judicious about where we put our time. And so typically, we, we try to simplify the model, and particularly early on. And we applied the Agni principle, which is uh, well known in software engineering. Yeah, ain't going to need it. You know, you start as simple as possible, and you learn from it. And with modeling, it's all the more important because modeling is about learning. It's about improving our understanding. And often we'll be much more savvy later and therefore better able to decide what should be in a model and what should not, what's the priority. I therefore emphasized because of this and other regions, reasons, I advocated for incremental model development, building models up in a step-by-step -step fashion. Um, where with each iteration, you're modifying it in some small way. You can test to make sure it works a lot easier if you've only modified a few things. If you compare it against the previous version, basically you can demonstrate uh, identical behavior through this extension. And, um, and these incremental versions have the virtue of also being able to be shown for system stakeholders and can produce insights, produce learning. 
And I argue that there's a variety of, of benefits to this, including better ability to, to estimate how long things will take, clarity and prioritization, ability to learn from what this particular change led to versus on a later iteration, that particular change. Whereas if you all just throw it in, you know, into a giant mix, it's really hard to know what change led to what behavior, which is often key to our learning. Um, yeah, so we, we talked about pattern-oriented modeling just a little bit. Uh, Agent-based models have this incredible ability, incredible flexibility. And, you know, often we, we seek to have them explain certain phenomena in the world that, that we're seeking to match up. Um, and we do this in system dynamics too. We talk about reference modes. We want the model to match. But in agent-based modeling, it may be spatial reference modes or reference modes like in system dynamics over time, or over a network spread or what have you. Any questions about, so I just went through, you know, um, a set of materials of philosophy and model process. And before going on to calibration sensitivity analysis, I'd like to know, are there any questions or comments or uh, other uh, points you'd like to put out there? Um, at this juncture. I'm monitoring the chat keenly. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I will continue on. Um, okay. So let's talk about calibration. The basic deal with calibration is look, we are seeking to leverage data from the world to inform our models very commonly. But a lot of data from the world is data on kind of emergent features in the world. And if we want to inform our model with it, typically it corresponds to things in the model that are not assumptions, but outcomes generated by the model. These emergent results of the model that cannot be traced to just one parameter or one stock or you know, initial value of a stock or, or what have you. It's, it's, it's kind of, glomming together all these different things to give rise to this behavior. Does it depend on the mean number of connections uh, per person in the network? Yeah. Does it depend on the contact rate? Yeah. Does it depend on how long they remain infected? Yeah. Depends on all these things. And it's kind of this emergent, you know, um, miasma of all those things that gives rise to this high level behavior. And we want to compare like the number of infections per week from our model with the number of infections per week from the world. We can't just say, we have this great data on number of infections per week model. Go assume that. No, it's something produced by the model. It's something emergent. It's something we want to understand how it comes about. So calibration still tries to use that data. We can't plug it in for any one parameter. But what we can do is try to make sure the model matches it, you know, is true to it, holds fidelity to it is consistent with it. I can use different terms. Um, so what we're trying to do often is change our assumptions about the model of different sorts so that the model gives rise to emergent behavior that's as close as possible to corresponding emergent behavior from the world. And uh, in so doing, we adjust a set of model assumptions encoded in parameters such that we try to get it, the model to match this data from the world. Boy, have we done that in spades frequently in the ABM model, COVID-19, and how? Because there's all this data we don't know, right? How often are people going out to gatherings? You know, how many people are wearing masks? You know, um, um, to what degree are people effectively social distancing in their homes over the holidays. I mean, 
all these different things. We're trying to adjust our assumptions to make sense of all the evidence at once. And that's the key. Not just one, say, time series, but the whole body of evidence about emergent behavior from the model. We need the model to stay true to all of it, to be kind of a competitive theory of what's going on in the world. One that's consistent, one that holds water, one that has face plausibility. So we're trying to adjust parameters such that the model matches some data. And we need to specify how, what does it mean to match it? Well, we have this discrepancy metric, this objective function that says, how close are they to each other? Um, and if it's a discrepancy metric, you know, bigger is worse. It means they're more discrepant. It's, they're less consistent. Or zero would mean they're bang on each other. Um, and you know, at the same time, we can't typically expect to capture every nook and cranny of that data because there's a lot of stochastics in the world just like there are in the model. And we can't expect the model to you know, perfectly predict this chance thing and that thing. But we try to get it to match pretty well, at least the, you know, the shape and the rough size of it and the timing of it or what have you. Um, so um, when we have these model stochastics, it's, it's more textured. And generally speaking, we're going to need to run a, an ensemble. There's that word again. A whole bunch of realizations, often a swack of realizations, a whole sort of set of them, maybe a hundred of them or whatever. Um, but at least a, you know, a small set that basically will um, uh, we'll do that for each parameter value. We'll see how well this models stack up against the data. We'll run a set of realizations. They only differ, when I say realizations here with an ensemble, they only differ with respect to the random number C. And we sort of look at the average discrepancy against the data. Some of them might be really far off, but some are pretty darn close. And, and we take kind of the average uh, of them. And so here, the whole point of this is to estimate parameters that we don't know well through other evidence. So we're adjusting these parameters and seeing what particular assumptions about those parameters make it best match this. And we have to run it many times per particular assumptions about those parameters, per parameter vector, particular value for this parameter, particular value for that parameter in return, all those. Each one will run it many times and see how well it stacks up and say, that looks pretty good. That's a pretty plausible set of values for those parameters. This one is for the birds, um, et cetera. It has a big discrepancy, whereas this preferred one has a small one. It's one that has a small one, therefore it is preferred. Um, and to estimate a greater number of parameters, you need more data generally um, to inform it, to pin it down what the values are, um, to make it identifiable. Um, any questions about calibration before I go on to sensitivity analysis? Is there a general rule in terms of the size of that kind of ensemble that you'd be running, say for an agent-based model when calibrating? Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, there are. Um, so, uh, there's some guidelines from statistical theory as to how many realizations you would need to get a given like estimate of the discrepancy to be within a certain range. So it's called the standard error to, to, to make the, the kind of level of variability. Because if you only do one, you know, one realization, you've got a lot of uncertainty about how on average good it is for this set of parameter values. If you do two, it's getting better. And in general, to divide that uncertainty about how good it is by a factor of two, you, um, you need to do four times as many simulations, um, uh, more four times as many realizations, excuse me. And there's some statistical theory for that to get this kind of standard error of the mean within certain values. And any logic actually has some things to do this, which are uh, rather nice and it will pick, it'll seek to pick given the sample standard deviation, the actual variability in results, for example, it will seek to pick a number of realizations, what it calls 
realization, or sorry, what it calls replications, but it's basically realizations, uh, such that you'll get a certain statistical accuracy in, in uh, knowing about, about this. Um, so, so there's some guidelines there. That's all I probably have time to say right now, but uh, there is some good statistical theory you can use and it's, uh, and it's useful. Yeah. You won't be tested on it here, but it's a great question. Additional questions? So you might ask me like, what are we could be tested on? Well, I need to know that there's a need for a discrepancy metric. And what, it, what do I mean if I say discrepancy metric? Well, talk about this kind of badness of fit, as it were, between the data, the outcomes from the model compared to comparable data from the world. You're, that you're adjusting parameters, you should know that. Matching data from the world, you should know that. Can't just plug this data in for parameter values because it's kind of from this, you know, this tangling of all these different things. You can't just plug it in, and calibration is helping us deal with that. These are the sort of things you should know in this area, okay? And and that stochastics you know, cause headaches, and one of the ways we deal with them here and elsewhere is we run ensembles, and sometimes we need more to be more statistically confident about the results that we've really captured the regularities of the situation and not just a, a chance fluke. Okay, let's talk about sensitive analysis. So sensitive analysis is something rather different. Um, I mean, it's similar in a certain way. We're adjusting parameter values. We are needing to deal with stochastics by running ensembles. Um, uh, but our goal is quite different. We're, you know, with calibration, we're trying to match data from the world. Sensitive analysis, we're not. We're trying to understand how model output will change as we adjust certain assumptions about the model. And most commonly, those are just the parameters of the model. But, but you can also modify model structure, like delete a stock or, you know, get rid of a state or add an asymptomatic state or add a state of you know, um, uh, of, of, of uh, someone who's shedding, you know, an unusually high quantities or whatever. And, um, and then you can see how that modification to model structure, um, you know, how much change in the output is caused by that assumption. And if it's small potatoes, it may not be a high priority. If it makes a huge difference, a qualitative difference, the outcome, maybe you should think about putting that in, like adding a transition back from recovered to susceptible might make a huge difference within the time frame. You didn't think it would, but you know, our thinking on this is flawed for the for the even the most quantitative of us. Our thinking tends to lead us astray. And um, so we build a model, it's more consistent in figuring out the implications. And if it says it's a big change, you better put that in there. So the goal here is to understand just how sensitive model outputs are, outcomes are, and sometimes choices to be made based on those model outcomes, depending on model assumption. When I say sometimes the, cha the, the, um, the choices, well, sometimes we wanna know, you know, how much does a model outcome change as we, so if we adjust this parameter by 10% larger, 10% smaller, does this outcome, you know, go 200% larger and 50% smaller? Or does it just go 10%, 10% or, you know, just 1%, 3% smaller? You know, um, this could differ with a nonlinear model, particularly around the current point. And, and uh, sensitive analysis can help us determine that, okay? Um, but then there are times where like our real interest is not just understanding that. It's like, hey, is this decision better than that one in terms of the outcomes? And for that, uh, you know, maybe we want to say, okay, we'll adjust these parameters. But maybe even though, you know, the outcomes are very dependent on the parameters, the, rel the relative value of, of, of those two interventions, of those two scenario stays the same you know we just parameters and you know it's modifying this a lot as we change the parameters that's the 
outcome for one intervention. It's modifying this one a lot as we change the parameters, but maybe they're both like this, you know, they're both higher or they're both lower at the same time in this one always yield better outcomes than this one. Um, that's, that's a form of sensitive analysis. Um, so there's many types of it, many variants of it, but you know, these are basically the main things I want you to know about. I do want you to know about structural sensitivity analysis. And yeah, if you have st statistical variability, just as Jalen asked, we, you know, we need to run more realizations. We, we, we don't want to say, oh, there's great variability because of this parameter when really it's just a matter of, there's a lot of variability due to the, the random number generation. You know, if maybe maybe you you have to run it many times to really see. Oh yeah, when I change this parameter to a high value, this the outcome goes up, and then change it to a low value, it, it goes down. Whereas if you just ran it with one realization, and we're going, and you know, it's not really obvious how much is chance and how much is due to the, the parameters. It doesn't always make that sound when you're doing it. Although it's pretty cool when it does. Um, Okay, so that's sensitive analysis. Any questions about that? Going once, going twice. Okay, let's talk about system dynamics. So system dynamics, okay, I'm just uh, triaging things here. Um, with, uh, keeps on kicking me out of Zoom. This isn't happening to everyone. Um, uh, maybe it thinks I'm a troublemaker or something. Um, okay, so uh, continuing on, I, I may be missing chat chat messages and I'm sort of joining this as a, a viewer to watch the chat and it keeps on kicking me out and each time it's a blank chat. Um, uh, when I'm not present at all, it's kind of like Schrodinger's cat, um, which if you don't find it, could be a good pun. Uh, okay, so um, let's talk about uh, feedback. Um, so uh, feedback is central to system dynamics model. Cent a system dynamics model prizes, um, you know, two, um, two points of understanding um, associated with models. Um, using models to understand feedback structure and accumulation. And uh, feedback comes in two major forms, reinforcing and balancing. And uh, it's not that reinforcing is bad and balancing is good, although it can be the case, but there can be cases where, you know, you are seeking, for example, reinforcing feedback. Um, maybe you want a peer messaging campaign to, uh, to improve, um, access to mental health uh, services, or maybe you want to, um, uh, to have a viral marketing campaign for your startup or whatever. Um, maybe you want that reinforcing feedback, you know, word of mouth to lead to want from one person loving your product to two people loving it to four or whatever. Uh, or maybe you, you're trying to spread the word about availability of a uh, of this uh, vaccine and, and try to get people out to take the vaccine and you want to you want viral messaging for that. So reinforcing feedback can be good, but it's it's unstable. It, it, it quickly sort of builds on itself and there tends to be limits to it. How far how long it can go on before, uh, you know, things give out uh, with that. Um, but it can also be bad and, and bouncing feedback can be good. It can be associated with uh, resiliency. But it can also lead to kind of lock-in effects where people are in difficult circumstances and they can't break out. So reinforcing feedback is associated with positive feedback. It's associated with this divergent behavior. Uh, think, you know, the number of infection cases rising, rising, rising faster and faster in Ontario. Uh, or it can be associated with stability, where it sort of seeks some equilibrium. We talked a lot about first-order delays. Um, uh, here, the uh, outflow depends linearly on the value of the stock. And this outflow is specified either in terms of a chance per unit time of leaving or a mean amount of time in the stock. If it's a chance per unit time of leaving, the outflow is associated with the formula of that chance per unit time of leaving times the value of the stock. 
it has to be the case because this is of unit one over time. Um, by contrast, if you have a uh, mean time in the stock, if that's the value of the constant, the formula for the outflow is the stock divided by that mean time. And it has to be the case because now the, the parameters associated with a unit of time and, and therefore to have the outflow be people per unit time, you need to divide by it. So if you keep that in mind, it's harder to make a mistake uh, on that. Okay. Um, oh my gosh. Um, so, you know, if we have, um, if we have different lengths of time within that stock, uh, it tends to lead to different behavior. For example, if, uh, if we have some zero immigration rate and then it shoots up to a high value, um, the, uh, there's gonna be an imbalance between inflow and outflow. So the stock's gonna rise, but how quickly it rises and how quickly it equilibrates at its ultimate value will depend on, on this value. And if uh, this value is very short, value associated with the average time within the stock, uh, it will equilibrate quickly. And if it's, uh, yeah, what's up? Um, if it's uh, a very uh, long amount of time in the stock, it goes up uh, more slowly and it equilibrates more slowly. So this is why this is called a first sort of delay because the immigration here uh, sort of was zero for a long time and then it suddenly shot up to uh, a fixed value. And this stock is following it with some delay. And um, you could see that the value of the, the constant uh, outflow, in this case, it's how long they're in the stock, not, not alpha. Um, it'll vary how quickly it, it follows it. And generally it will go up until the point where it's approaching the point where inflow equals outflow. That's the state this wants to reach. Because if there's an imbalance, if outflow is greater than inflow, the stock will rise until outflow equals inflow. If the, the inflow is less than the outflow, the stock will fall until outflow equals inflow. I mean, until inflow equals outflow. You could see it either way. Um, so it's kind of a self-adjusting system that gets itself back into balance. Um, and the state of equilibrium, this outflow will equal the end. Okay. Um, and the value of the stock will be, um, will relate to this uh, the outflow accordingly. So if it's specified a chance per unit time of leaving, the value of the stock will be this value divided by alpha. It's because the flow is the stock times alpha. So the value of the stock is divided by alpha, it's simple algebra. Um, and similarly, if you have a, well, average length of time here, the outflow is the stock divided by that average length of time. The value of the stock is just going to be the value of the flow times the average length of time you spend in it, which makes sense because uh, the average length of time means the value of the stock is just going to be immigration amount coming in this times the length of time if immigration is constant. It just accumulates for that amount of time on average. There's that many time worth of people um, in in the equilibrium value of the stock. Okay, um, so um, we we've gone through uh, the dynamics associated with this. These sort of first order delays are equilibrium seeking. They seek their outflow to equal their inflow, okay? and that induces an equilibrium on the on the stock. Um, Okay, um, right. So, you know, I had mentioned earlier this notion that we have fewer building blocks with, uh, with system dynamics than we do with age based model. And uh, with system dynamics, our focus is on understanding how stocks and flows combine to yield high level behavior over time. With age based modeling, we combine this much larger set of primitives to understand how behavior, not only over time, but over space, over networks, et cetera, depend on, um, uh, depend on, uh, or how, how those things depend on agent-agent interactions and agent uh, 
environment uh, interactions. And we could follow individual individuals here and understand how their patterns, um, whereas in system dynamics, aggregate system dynamics, we're just dealing with snapshots over time, as, as we say, cross sections over time with the number of people at different stocks. So here's a bunch of, you know, any logic mechanisms that um, you, you may remember and you're not going to be you know, tested uh, on all of those um, or on, on these, this is, is not my goal. Um, you should know that events exist to kind of schedule a series of events or one-time events. It's probably a common enough thing that it's a good thing to know that and, and about messages being sent, et cetera. Um, this thing is kind of uh, messed up as a, a diagram here. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, okay, mumble, sorry. Give me, give me just a sec so I can, uh, boom. Um, okay, yeah, that's better. Okay, there we go. Um, okay. Uh, so we talked about first order delays. Aging chains and competing risks, you'll have to look at the um, slides and uh, discussions I gave earlier. But basically, as I said earlier in this session, having two outflows from a given stock um, means one outflow will induce changes in the average length of time it takes to leave via the other outflow. Um, they sort of compete with each other, as it were. Um, and if you link these things together, oh yeah, this is important. This is important, yeah. Um, um, so this is memoryless. Um, I'm gonna take the note down for our next session. Um, this is a memoryless uh, stock. It doesn't matter when someone came in, they have the same chance of being at time of leaving. They may have come in yesterday or may have come in three days ago or 10 years ago. Their chance per unit time, the kick of the can is the same per, per unit time. Um, of course, if they came in 10 years ago, they're a lot less likely to be there, but if they still, but if they are there still, their chance of leaving per unit time is the same. It doesn't care how long they've been there. This is just a kind of mixed together group of people in X, the stock X. That's important. If you start stringing these things together into aging chains, um, your chance of leaving that aging chain is not the same, regardless of how long you've been in that aging chain. It's, you have a series of these plugged together. Um, uh, you know, you're much, much, much less likely to have someone who made it through to the end and, and left all three stocks in a row, all three first order delays composed together than it is that they leave later. Um, uh, over time, there's gonna be a bolus of people kind of moving through. And so this is memoryless. Um, by contrast, the aging chain as a whole is not memoryless. Um, it, it actually does keep track. That's why we join them together. Okay, any questions about this? I've kind of gone gone through some of these basics with system dynamics. Any questions about it? Um, I guess one quick question. Yeah. Um, just uh... in response to that question. Um, Causal loop diagrams um, would not traditionally include stocks. So, so this is a close cousin of causal loop diagrams. It's, it's not quite complete because with a causal loop diagram, we'd label each arrow with a polarity plus or minus. And there's a really neat kind of very straightforward thing you can, um, analysis you can do to figure out is it a plus or a minus. Um, uh, this is a variant of causal loop diagrams that's somewhat more elaborated called, called a system structure diagram, okay? And so is this. Um, uh, this is a causal loop diagram. So you notice each arrow is associated with pluses and minus, although this one is kind of hidden. And, and there's kind of these labels for whether an entire loop is a reinforcing feedback, hence plus, or a balancing feedback, minus. Um, 
This is a causal loop diagram. And there's a whole kind of cottage industry within system dynamics um, uh, practice, which um, involves building causal loop diagrams to understand systems. And often this is kind of a first stage of building up a system dynamics model. You build up a causal loop diagram, then maybe you elaborate in a system structure diagram by making some of these things stops explicitly. And then you start elaborating the flows in and flows out. Um, and there's a real art to building these up. And they can be very beautiful. They can be uh, very insightful sometimes, but they're not simulation models. Like you can't run a simulation on this by itself. What you can do is understand something about the dynamics because positive feedback loops are associated with divergent behavior and negatives with negative feedback loops with, with uh, stability, with uh, approaching some equilibrium. It wants to get back to an equilibrium. And these are really neat diagrams to, um, to kind of think through how these things are connected. And, and as I say, with this cottage industry, it's kind of a lot of this is participatory. So you draw together stakeholders from diverse backgrounds and understanding and they build these diagrams together and you, you kind of refine them and you can get some insights to get you going on a project that you then turn into a quantitative model often. Um, there are people who stop here, but often you turn it into a quantitative model. And um, there's another side of these too, which is some, um, some researchers in system dynamics basically have used, they, they keep a representation like this, but they also keep around a, so, so this is kind of for a, this is just you know an arbitrary example. I'm showing a stock and flow diagram that's fully quantified. And they also keep along a causal loop diagram. And then basically there are these analysis algorithms can, that can be run on your stock and flow diagram whilst it's running that basically can be used to show which of these loops are dominant at any given point. And, you know, which of them are sort of driving the system behavior at any one point. And you'll find that actually there's a thing called loop gain um, which will tell you, for example, right now, what's really driving the dynamics we see within COVID-19 is new infections, or what's really, really driving it is recovery rates, or what's really, really driving it is, you know, uh, the, you know, uh, the greater number of people being vaccinated. And so you can do this analysis live, and, it, and it's very quantitative, um, it involves eigenvalues and so on, and, and, and you can derive what are the driving loops, and in turn, use it to show on a causal, associated causal loop diagram what's going on. Um, so that's a little bit about causal loop diagrams. They're not purely qualitative. They, they have their quantitative side. And in general, they're kind of semi-quantitative, even just in the most basic form for reasoning it through. Hope that's helpful. Uh, you're not responsible for knowing how to put these together for this class. If you go back to previous versions of the class, I sometimes have a lecture where we walk through it. And in 371, I actually uh, show people how to build up these diagrams for software engineering project management um, in some of the versions of that course. Hopefully that's helpful. Okay. Um, so formal analysis. Um, uh, we, um, we talked within the uh, class about a couple of types of formal analysis. Um, one is the uh, determination of equilibria. And we, I walked in, in class through determining the location of equilibria. Uh, there's a problem set example where um, I asked to determine stability of, of equilibria, but uh, I, I really want you for the sake of the exam to know that you can demonstrate stability, why it's important to demonstrate stability that you, that it's computed using these eigenvalues around a certain equilibrium. Um, uh, so it's, it's these, these points around a certain equilibrium. We're trying to find out if that equilibrium is stable. If we knock it a little bit, if we have an infected person come in, for example, um, or someone by you know, chance um, uh, recovers early, will that 
tend to lead the system to kind of diverge in behavior or will it, it stay, it just bounce back? That's really the question with stability. Does the system bounce back or does it go off and spiral out of control? Um, and uh, we talked about intuitions for them. Um, I, I showed some diagrams with state space analysis and I want you to know something about where those come from. And then we talked about uh, dynamics of first order delays. Now, in this sphere, um, a lot of our application examples were with, in fact, all, no, that's not true, not all, like our first order delays, we weren't predominantly talking about infectious disease models, but a lot of, uh, certainly this one was infectious disease models. And there we had a certain structure and you need to know that structure very well. You know, so you have the C times beta. So the force of infection is going to be the chance per unit time a given susceptible gets infected, right? So the number of infections per unit time is the force of infection times the number of susceptibles. Force of infection in turn is gonna be this chance per unit time a susceptible gets infected. And that depends on how many contacts they have per unit time. The fraction of people in the population that are infective right now, um, and then times beta, that's the approximation that's used. And that's, that's gonna be the, the force of infection. So C times, I over S plus I plus N or plus R rather the, to, to unpack that further times beta in this, in this case. Um, and, and you should be familiar you know, with that structure. Um, given the structure, um, you'll, you should also be able to write down something like the basic reproductive number for this model. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, uh, but for those who are, you know, keen to uh, to know uh, what it is, uh, basically it's it's going to be c times beta times tau. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so uh, we'll come back to that point. So this can be formulated in this sort of form, and you should know how to take a model like this and write it down like that. Each of these, you know, you should be aware that each of these flows from one stock to the other gets turned into two terms here, right? Like this flow, infection flow, is reflected here and here. It flows out of S, so it's associated with a minus sign in front of it. It flows into I, so it's associated with a plus sign. Um, uh, this flow here. Uh, flows out of I and into R, oops. Um, so it flows out of I, hence the minus, and, and into R, hence this positive term. And then there's a flow out of R into its susceptible. Um, so uh, you should feel comfortable with it. And one of the things I did for this stage was things like solve this. So look, if you want to know, like, what's the equilibrium? Equilibrium is a situation where the system's in balance, where nothing's changing. Um, sometimes I somewhat glibly, I mean, there's a reason to it, but uh, sometimes I appeal to a notion of almost a dynamic equilibrium where it's cycling around a certain point, like we saw with gophers and coyotes. Um, but generally speaking, when we talk about equilibrium, we're talking about fixed points of the system. We're talking about the, the, the points of stability um, and the critical points are sometimes called where nothing's changing. And what that means is that the stocks aren't changing. S is not changing. I is not changing. R is not changing. The rate of change for S is zero, for I is zero, for R is zero. And what that means is S dot is zero, I dot is zero, R dot is zero, okay? so. To analyze that, basically, we want to solve to figure out where the equilibrium is. When I say solve for the equilibrium, what I'm talking about is solve for values of at what point for values of susceptible, infected, and recovered will the system be at equilibrium? So this can be one point where like S equals this, I equals that, and R equals that. That might be one. And then another one would be S equals that, R equals that, and, and R equals that. A given point here, when we say the location of an equilibrium, 
that is a certain value for susceptible, certain value for infected, a certain recovery. It's the state of the system at that point. Um, so you have to give a number for susceptible, infected, and recovered. Okay. I'm trying to emphasize some real basics here. Um, I mark all the final exam entirely by myself, and uh, I give lots of partial credit. And so if you, even if you get lost, just writing on some basics will get you some credit. I'll say, oh, okay, look, you know, he knows what he's doing at least a little bit here. He's written that down. That's great. He knows he has to solve for a particular value for S and I and R. That's great. Okay, that's, that's a good step. And I, I, I'm fairly generous with partial credit. Um, so try to tell me, you know, what you're doing by writing down some basics, okay? So you're trying to find a value for S, I, and R where this system will be in equilibrium, meaning S dot equals zero, I dot equals zero, R dot equals zero. So if we write this down, okay, I'm gonna solve that. Okay, well, let's let's simplify it, right? We went through this in class. I'm not gonna elaborate much, but basically you say, oh, look, there's a conservation of people. People are either S state, I state, and R state, or R state. They just shuffle between them, right? So the total population is constant. We'll give it a nice name, N. And we'll just say, well, look, all we have to specify is S or and I, and R is given. It's just going to be n minus the sum of s and i. So we we don't have to solve for all three where it's in balance. Um, we'll just solve for s and i. And so s dot equals zero, i dot equals zero. And if those two are zero, those two aren't changing. R can't be changing either because it's just the rest of the population. And if these two aren't aren't changing, they're fixed. R is not going to be able to change. It doesn't have that degree of freedom. There's no wiggle room, right? So. So we say, okay, R equals the rest of the population. Okay, great. So all we have to set, solve now is S dot equals zero and I dot equals zero. We have to find a value of S, I, and R such that S dot equals zero and I dot equals zero. And that will give us a thing where I, R dot equals zero guaranteed. So, okay, look, and then we have to substitute it. Okay, if R is this, well, look, uh, um, we may have to substitute things in because there's an R here, right? So we have to go expand this into be omega times S minus I minus uh, S, S minus it, ah, N minus S minus I quantity. So there we go. There we go. That's just, that's just substituting this R into there. Okay. So then we want to solve this. Okay. Okay. So we want to solve for that. Okay. So, so, uh, Okay, let's try to figure out how i equals zero. Okay, if, if i equals zero, then this guy has to equal zero. Oh, look, there's an i on uh, here. Oh man, that's great. Um, uh, so we could factor that i out. Great, and I, I did a bit of rearrangement by multiplying things. We don't have these pesky fractions around. Uh, and then I have two cases, one where i equals zero. Maybe, maybe this is equal to zero because i is zero. That's a possibility, right? That would make i dot equals zero. This, this thing could equal zero because i is zero. The other reason is because s is such that this thing in here inside the parens, that, that's equal to zero. Okay, so we go through the two cases and you turn the crank, you, you solve for this one, then you have to solve uh, for each of these cases, you get something, you solve for it. Like the first one, it's just i equals zero. Okay, if we have i equals zero, then Okay, well, this one's automatically equal to zero. That's great. But then we got to plug it in here. So i equals zero, this, this minus i is going to go away. This whole term is going to go away because we have zero times whatever. And so that's good. It's just going to go away. And so then we have to have, oh my gosh, uh, dot omega times n minus s has to equal zero because s dot equals zero. And okay, so s has got to be n. For, for omega times n minus s to be zero, no matter what omega is, the only way that can be the case is if s equals n. So s equals n, i equals zero, and the rest of the population r, well, s is already n, so there's nobody in r. So that's one solution right there. And you could solve for the other solution. So this, it, with knowing with the other solution, i is not equal to zero. So we, we, we rule that out S equals zero and, and we figure out what S is. And then we use this equation up here. We plug in for S here and here. And then we figure out what I has to be. Boom, um, and we get done. So that's solving 
for the location of equilibria. And that's going to give me two, you know, two triples. Um, one where, you know, each one is going to specify if I for susceptible effective recovered such that S dot equals I dot equal R dot equals zero. That's what it's going to do. Okay. So that's solving these things. Do I expect you to be able to do that? You bet I expect you to be able to do that. And I've just, once again, rehearsed how you do that. Um, so any questions about that process? Question. You'll find, I think, my lectures and my lecture three of infectious disease modeling. I think I may have gone through it, if not lecture two. Yeah. Um, okay, discrete event modeling. Um, I'm watching the time, and I think we've talked uh, enough about that, but basically, if these entities, these resources that limit entities flow through the workflows, you have these flow paths. We have queues, um, some things like the throughput are emergent. Um, how much time it takes for an agent to be treated is emergent, right? It depends on the placement of resources, what resources are free, et cetera. Um, okay. Um, I think I'll come back to this, but I, I wanna go through some more uh, basic things. If, if we have time, I'll, I'll come back to this. Um, okay, talk about nonlinearity. So nonlinearity was this, phenomena where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts um, with respect to, to functions. And um, where if, you know, if you apply a function to sum of pieces, it's not the same as applying the function to each piece and then summing up the results. Um, so, you know, for where we saw this in spades was for infectious disease models. Um, if, if we have a system where we have, you know, like one infective and a thousand susceptibles, um, and we want to know what's going to happen over time because of that. That's not the, we can't solve for that by having on the one hand, a system with just susceptibles, no infectives, simulating what happens with that. And, and then, then just infectives, no susceptible, simulating what happens to that. And then somehow expect to sum them together to get the result with both together. It, it doesn't work like that. It takes two to tango. There's, there's this interaction between susceptibles and infectives that's enshrined in this nonlinear term associated right with, uh, with these models right, right you know, there, right? This is the nonlinear term, S times I is occurring there. You need both um, and they're multiplied together. So, um, that's that's where the nonlinearity comes in, and it means it it means we can't simulate each separately. It also means that it also leads to the fact there can be more than one equilibrium. It also means we have to simulate it. We can't, in general, solve it directly through some sort of writing down what the solution is over time, um, and it can lead to counterintuitive behavior behavior that's not obvious. Um, uh, even the most quantitative people, you know, uh, and Einstein is not going to be able to anticipate uh, intuitively the behavior of a nonlinear system in general. It, it, it leads to all sorts of uh, counterintuitive behaviors that our wetware is just not set up to, to, to allow us to sort of simulate properly. Um, and it can lead to, you know, if, if we want to know how much would different COVID-19 policies help, it means that those results are not additive. We have to simulate them together to see how much they would how benefit, they would confer together. We can't just simulate each separately and add the results together. Um, uh, and it, it also means, you know, if we double our investment in something, it doesn't mean doubling the results, for example. Um, okay, now in an infectious disease context, we typically have multiple equilibria um, and multiple tipping points. Um, uh, and very commonly, particularly for open systems, 
we had a, a disease-free equilibrium. We saw that earlier with I equals zero. There's no one infected. And then we had a endemic equilibrium, one where there's, um, the, in the long term, there's people staying infected. At any one time, there's somebody infected or some group of people infected. Maybe it fluctuates a little bit, but it, there's, there's some, some number of people staying infected, and yet the system as a whole is in balance. Um, and unfortunately, we're moving towards a COVID-19 endemic situation across the world, and, uh, in the US, and unfortunately in Canada, and indeed in our fair province. Um, now, when we have these multiple equilibria, you can have multiple endemic equilibria. And it's actually really neat to see it. Um, uh, and commonly, we will have these, as we say, common uh, separate basins of attraction, meaning that like an equilibrium may draw things nearby itself into it. But um, there may be competing equilibria elsewhere that will draw things into them. And there's kind of these catchment areas where you can go from like an ende endemic equilibrium, which is stable, to a disease-free equilibrium, which is stable. If you just push enough, you get to a tipping point. And this is a key hallmark of nonlinear systems. I want you to make, of which I want you to make note. There are these tipping points, these systems where the situation where the behavior qualitatively differs. It's like reaching herd immunity and in the infection dies out in the population. Or like, you know, um, uh, water vapor condensing into water or water freezing into ice. Um, there's these phase changes where there's just dramatic change and it's like night and day. It's qualitatively different. And it's the feature of nonlinear systems that we have these tipping points often. Um, and the tipping points um, have very practical consequences. Like if we can just reach them, if we can just vaccinate enough people quick enough, we may be able to drive, you know, COVID-19 out of existence. Given how people are accept low acceptance rates we're getting of, of vaccines, sadly in our province, there's no way we're gonna reach that anytime soon. Um, if you can encourage people to get it, we may have a chance. Young people will be key. Getting your vaccines eventually when it's, uh, when it's possible will be key, but it's gonna be very, very hard. But, you know, in general, uh, that's what we're seeking. And the realization is if we can make enough effort, at some point it will all pay off and it can be driven out of existence, much like smallpox was driven to extinction and doesn't exist anymore. We can, we can achieve something that's qualitatively better where we don't have to keep on spending money on it, et cetera. And these are you know, key within infectious disease models. Um, uh, I do expect you for infectious disease models to have you know, great facility and key intuitions basic structural formulas, tipping points associated with them, and really knowing about the difference between closed systems, systems which have no incoming population or leaving populations, and open systems, okay? Uh, and there's a really big difference in the dynamics elicited for each of these. Um, we spoke about uh, the equilibria, and there's some ways in which delays really play a big impact here. Um, uh, I do expect you to know something about vaccination, how it affects things, and there's this critical vaccination number. And I, I want you to be able to know the, the basic lingo of this field. So in terms of, you know, the incidence versus prevalence. Incidence is new cases per unit time. Prevalence is the fraction of people who have the infection, let's say, at a given time, or are infective at a given time. Prevalence of infection versus prevalence of infectives. Um, uh, there's the basic reproductive number um, and the effective reproductive number. Um, uh, there's the force of infection, which we've mentioned. There's something called the attack rate, which is the fraction of people who ultimately get infected by the end of the, the simulation time frame. Now, the basic reproductive number, um, which we write as R naught or R sub zero, um, this is the number of people which a single infective will on average infect 
if they are surrounded entirely by susceptibles. So there's just one infected, just surrounded by a sea of susceptibles. How many people will they infect before they recover? If that's less than one, the infection is going to peter out from the start. If they don't even infect one person to replace them by the time they recover on average, you know, the infection is not going to stick around because this is like perfect spreading ground. They're surrounded by susceptibles. They're not even going to infect one person there. It's, infection is just not going to be sustainable. By contrast, if it's greater than one, it can start to spread and one person can be got two and one infection can be got two and two can be got four and, and so on. It become four and eight and so on, right? Um, so um, for a closed population here um, uh, as well, you, you can get, you know, this infection spread, an outbreak will occur. And both open and closed share this characteristic that look, those, uh, Really, I mean, to be technical about it, I should probably say there's an outbreak. Occur. It's not necessarily technically, you know, an epidemic, but you don't have to worry about those distinctions. Does an outbreak occur? Yes, if it's greater than one, but not this case. Where these two really differ is the endemic state, okay? And um, look, for a case of a closed population, this is what happens. You get something where you have a large number of susceptibles at first, very few infectives. And um, unfortunately, this is a distracting thing going on with the recovered population. But basically, you get this rise uh, in infections um, exponentially at first. This is the positive feedback loop associated in the causal loop diagram with spread of infection. That's dominating. And then over time, it, the, each infective finds it harder and harder to transmit. And it and you know they're infecting fewer and fewer people before they recover. That's the effective reproductive number. It's like the basic reproductive number, but it's for right now in time, given how many susceptibles versus how many people are really the fraction of people that are susceptible around them right now. Um, whereas basic reproductive number is like the effective reproductive number for the very special case where everyone is susceptible around them. Effective is like right now, given situation out there right now. How many people they infect? And in general, the number of infectives will rise, continue to rise, inflow will be greater than outflow, uh, as long as the they're infecting more than one person. I think them leaving, as they leave, others have come in to replace them that are more than one. The inflow is greater than the outflow. So it's going to continue to rise until it equals one. And that's this key point. At this key point, it starts no longer being susceptible, no longer being sustainable. And then, then it starts trending downwards. And why does it trend downwards? Well, outflow is greater than inflow, so you have that. But there's also fewer and fewer uh, susceptibles yet. Susceptible still is going down yet further. It's becoming harder and harder and harder for those remaining infectives to infect more than one person. We're coming harder yet, becoming harder yet. And lots of them are, are recovering and you're going to get fewer and fewer infections occurring all through that time. So the net flow into the stock as a whole of infectives is gonna be getting smaller and smaller because there's not only fewer susceptibles, but fewer infected and infective people to infect them. And really this is driven by recovery mostly. And, and so you have a dropping down. Now, the key thing though, that I need you to know Students, for some reason, often get confused about this. When you have this, it's not the case that all the susceptibles get used up. You can see there's some residual susceptibles here. It's just like when you have a fire in a fireplace, it doesn't burn through all the wood. There's some bits of un, you know, wood that weren't burnt through. But at some point, it died out because it was no longer sustainable. There wasn't enough of that unburnt wood. And so there are people who remain at the end of this, even in the closed system, who are susceptible, who remain susceptible. But the number of infectives is going down and down and down and keeps on going down. It's going, it's approaching zero. And, um, but 
there can still be susceptibles around. There's just there's just too few of them, too small a fraction of them to make it sustainable for the infection to spread. So each infected will infect fewer than one person. Okay, so um, I, I've kind of narrated this uh, here, and you could view at this tipping point if from a, a level of a particular person, like they infect on average one person before they recover exactly at this plateau, or you could view it from the standpoint of stocks and flows. Inflow equals outflow, right? The number of new people getting infected equals the rate of people leaving the infectious stock. Um, uh, equal, both of those are legitimate, equally legitimate kind of standpoints. Okay, um, let me let me see if I can get these uh, fitting. There we go. Um, okay, so uh, that's just a, a bit of a perspective here um, on what's going on. That's for uh, this this case of a closed population. Um, you know, so the number of fractions susceptible at the end is, is greater than zero. There's some people left over. Um, now, for an open population, the situation changes really uh, quite dramatically. By the way, here are some, for those who have forgotten this, this is some sort of, uh, you know, uh, reminders on, on the basic terms here. But time is short, and I, I really want to... Um, make sure we, we can go through uh, the rest of the material and hopefully get some questions. Okay, with an open population, there's a turnover involved, and, and this thing's in the wrong order here. Um, there's turnover involved, okay? So, um, uh, and, and this makes all the difference. Uh, the greater the fraction, because it's depletion of susceptibles that leads this infection to die out to lead it to become less and less efficient for each infective to infect someone and for then it to drop down. Um, now, once you have an open population, it's a different thing. Just like the fire died out because there's a shortage of wood, an open population is like you're shoveling wood into the fire over time, right? You keep on replenishing it and the fresh wood corresponds to susceptibles uh, here in terms of rates of infection. So here you get something like this. And this is really valuable to understand. It's expected that you'll understand it. And I think it's laid out reasonably well uh, here and in other things. So, so look, you start with a large number of susceptibles. These are the blue. And you start with a very small number of infectives. These are the, the red. And uh, the green is a uh, force of infection. Is chance per unit time someone will get infected. And look, um, initially, each infective is surrounded by tons and tons of susceptibles. It's, you know, it could just spread it like crazy uh, around them. So the number of infectives just goes up and up and up. Two, four, you know, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, and so on. And it's just rising, rising, rising exponentially. You can just see it there. And um, it rises, but while that's rising, they're infecting susceptibles. So there's fewer and fewer susceptibles. So just like in the closed case, they're very similar up to this point and so on. Um, you get this, you know, becoming less and less efficient, and you get this plateau where inflow equals outflow, and where each infective infects uh, exactly one susceptible before that they before they um, before they recover. Now, um, uh, the number of susceptibles here, um, it's not an accident that this is reaching a peak at a certain fraction of susceptibles. So if you, if you make a note of that, that's, that's something like here. And you'll find that that's exactly the equilibrium value. That is the fraction so that is the number of susceptibles. And here, the fraction of the population that's susceptible is the more important quantity um, that uh, at which the system is in equilibrium. It, it needs a certain fraction for it to be efficient to pass on the infection, to pass it on to more than one person. And that point is occurring here. And you'll notice it's the same as the equilibrium value. 
And it's oscillating, this fraction is oscillating around that from then on. Um, and, uh, and so you have here the, the fraction of people that are susceptible is going to be the fraction at endemic equilibrium. And so beyond that, you're going to get each infective infecting fewer than one person. And, and so the number of infectives is going to be coming down. The inflow is going to be less than the outflow. It's going to be coming down. Now, it's going to come down for a while. But you'll notice that the number of susceptibles is still dropping because you're still infecting enough susceptibles to be greater than the inflow to susceptibles. So the number of susceptibles is still dropping for a while because there's still, okay, infectives may be dropping, but it's still large enough that it's draining, net, has a net drain on the number of susceptibles. It's dropping. Now, at some point though, the number of infectives becomes small enough that hey, the inflows to susceptibles. Remember, this is an open population. The inflows to susceptibles now equal the outflows from, from infection of susceptibles. And, you know, there's this brief plateauing. And then the number of infectives, well, this is much lower a value of a fraction of susceptibles than it was up here at equilibrium. And so number of infectives is going to still drop, drop, drop like a rock. And, and so it's going down even further to the number of infectives. And so the inflow to, for, for susceptibles is gonna be even larger than the outflow, larger and larger than the outflow. And so the number of susceptibles is gonna to start to replenish. It's gonna rise. And so it's gonna rise and rise. But notice, even as it rises, the number of infectives is still dropping. Why? Because it's still not efficient enough. Right? It's still not a large enough fraction of susceptibles to make infection efficient, right? to make, make them infect at least one person before they recover, to make the inflow to infectives equal to the outflow to infectives. And so the number of infectives is still dropping and it allows susceptibles to replenish, replenish, replenish. Um, they're lulled into a false sense of complacency. Think COVID-19 is forever gone over the summer. And um, so it's the number of, of susceptibles is rising, rising, rising. And then, oh, can you folks still hear me? Hello? Uh-oh. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Um, we'll restart the recording and we will see what happens. Um, okay, so I had been narrating this and what I had, uh, what I've been stating on this graph. Oh, oh can you, uh, no, can't see my graph. So let me, boom. Can you see my screen now? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So what I've been describing was this replenishment of susceptibles and, and the number of susceptibles rises up to a level that is not sustainable. It rises up beyond the point where it becomes, um, uh, if uh, where where infectives can infect more than one person again, and so the number of infectives starts rising, but there's a delay before the number of infectives becomes large enough to make to to make uh, to to bring uh, susceptibles uh, into a plateau state. Susceptibles rise yet further, so infectives are rising, but. Um, but susceptibles still rise for a while because infectives have to build up, build up, build up. And then at some point, infectives, uh, there are enough infectives infecting susceptibles that number of inflow equals outflow to susceptibles and it plateaus. And then it brings down again, you get the second outbreak, you get this waves of infection. And then you get a decline in susceptibles again, below the sustainable level, infective starts to go down then susceptibles overshoot again, they rise up and they overshoot the endemic level, infectives rise. And you get this kind of um, approach to this endemic equilibria with these little outbreaks. Um, so these delays are key as well. There's a delay associated with building up any, enough infectives to make in, uh, susceptibles no longer rise here. There's a delay in building up infectives to make allow susceptible, so susceptibles rise above the endemic level here. And um, in general, 
And these delays contribute to these kind of waves that you get. Ladies and gentlemen, when you have a, mark my words, this is uh, the result of a negative feedback. But as you may recall, negative feedbacks lead to stability. They lead to approach to equilibrium um, uh, by and large. But if there's a delay within them, if there's a long delay within that negative feedback, it leads to oscillations. And that's exactly what you see here. The reinforcing feedback is over here and this exponential growth and effectives, but there's a balancing feedback that leads it to approach equilibrium, but it, because it has a long delay associated with buildup amongst other things of infectives, um, you get this oscillation and the oscillation approaches this, this value eventually of equilibrium, but with these waves. Okay, um, so I described some, some delays here. Um, right, and I kind of narrate that. Now, when it comes to immunization, um, vaccination, I use the terms interchangeably, um, what we're trying to do is reduce the number of infectives by sh shifting uh, susceptibles to a, to a state where they're no longer susceptible. And uh, we do so, excuse me, um, we do so by, um, by successfully vaccinating those in the population, hopefully mostly susceptibles. Um, we try to avoid, avoid bother, um, you know, when people are infected, for example. Uh, and it may not be necessary for some conditions to vaccinate recovered individuals, such as measles, which have lifelong immunity believed to be associated with it. But we, we vaccinate. And the idea is we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to vaccinate enough people that even if everyone else is, is uh, susceptible, will still have an effective reproductive number less than one. And the effective reproductive number is just the fraction of people who are susceptible times the basic reproductive number. I don't show that here, but you could find it in my slides from lecture four or five, I think it was five, um, on infectious disease models. So um, we want the effective reproductive number to be less than one, even if everyone else besides the immunized folks are, are susceptible. Uh, everyone else is susceptible. We want there to be enough immunized that it makes it unsustainable for it to spread. And so working this thing through, what you find is a formula that has been trotted out implicitly within you know, countless news stories and, and press conferences and so on, which is you need a fraction of the population immunized that's at least one over, excuse me, at least one minus one over R naught, or one minus the reciprocal of R naught. Um, and uh, so if, if we're dealing with an infection that has uh, R naught, a basic reproductive number, say of four, you need at least 75% of the population uh, vaccinated. Why? Because it's one minus one over four. That's one minus 0.25 and 0.75, okay? So uh, that's, that's something that comes out of the fact that the effective reproductive number in general is just the basic reproductive number times the fraction of people that are currently susceptible. Okay. Um, uh, you know, something to, to realize, um, the minimum value of the stock of infectives is, is actually occurring at a different time than the minimum of, of, of incidence. Um, the number of infectives continues to decrease even though incidence is rising because outflow from infectives is less than inflow. Um, uh, and the maximum value of the stock infectives occurs at a different time than the maximum of incidence of new people being infected. Um, it's the stock of infectives get a rise as long as inflow is greater than outflow. Don't get confused that the stock is going to be at its maximum when the inflow is going to be at its maximum. No, 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 no. You have to worry about the outflow too, or the balance between them. Um, 
you, you need to think more critically than just assuming that the stock is at its maximum, if the inflow is at its maximum. Countless people do that, make that mistake worldwide, and it's it's a big problem in terms of decision making. Um, okay, uh, we're going to talk about uh, just state space. So um, I'm watching the time here. Uh, well, okay. Any questions about this? This is an important part, um, and there's some things I've had to rush through, including you know definition of force of infection. Chance per unit time someone will be infected. Any question on this people would like to bring forward right now? Question. Any questions? Any of these topics? I didn't emphasize it, but it's worth noting. The fraction of the population in an open system that remains susceptible is one over R naught, one over the basic reproduction. Why? Because the effective reproductive number is the basic reproductive number R naught times the fraction susceptible. We, we saw it in my little description there of, of the immunization threshold. This is the effective reproductive number. That's the number of pe people that a given infected is going to infect at that time before they recover. And if that's equal to one, it'll be exactly an equilibrium. They'll replace themselves by one person before they when when they recover. Um, so it'll be in balance if this thing equals one. Well, what's the fraction of, what's F need to be so that F times R naught is equal to one? Well, F needs to be one over R naught. And that's exactly what it is right here. It's exactly what it is. And that's what it says in this table, one over that. By contrast, the the fraction that are susceptible in a closed population at the end is not zero. It's greater than zero, but it's, you know, it's often much less than, than one. And it can be derived, but I'm not going to go into it here. So, um, and then there's a fraction effective at equilibrium such that infection rate equals recovery rate. Okay. Questions on this? This is actually really important stuff for the for the exam and, and, and for you to know coming out of the class. No questions? Okay. Okay, let's continue to go through this. Um, okay, so um, state space. Um, state space characterization basically creates a characterization of of a system's evolution um, in the context of its state values, the values of its states. And, and for a system dynamics model like this, it's in terms of the values of stocks. So within this space, there's one dimension for system dynamics models associated with each of its state variables. So at a given point in time, this system will have a certain value of, let's say both this is the SS, just, Maybe this is the y, the i axis, and this is this t1, ti1 axis, right? Um, so um, I'd, I'd really like to make that clear. Maybe this is s, um, maybe this is i, and and maybe this is uh, this uh, ti1. Okay. Um, so this is an example of state space and the system is going to be proceeding like a marble rolling. It's going to be proceeding down over time in state space. So maybe S is going to be getting smaller. Maybe this is at a, a bit of an angle so you can't see it easily, but I is increasing and this temporarily immune state is still low. But over time, temporarily immune is going to rise 
I is still going. Um, oh, mumble. This has got to be the other. Uh, ooh, 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 ooh. Um, okay, what is it? Uh, yeah, so I is growing. I is growing. I is growing, right? Um, S is, is becoming smaller. TI1 is, is growing and it's approaching an equilibrium. So at any given point, it has a particular value for S, for I, and for TI. Time is implicit here. It's kind of rolling along, but we're not showing it. This is an alternative to an over time graph. So we have a state space and we have trajectories in state space. Okay, the system etches out these trajectories. Um, there's fixed points. This is an example of a fixed point in state space. Um, uh, now, one thing I, I talked about is that when it comes to something like agent-based methods, and in fact, many other methods, there's, um, because of conservation rules, symmetries, uh, dimensional structure, the nominal and the intrinsic dimensionality could be quite different. This looks like a 3D graph, but if you actually look at it at the edge, it's actually only in 2D, it's in a plane. And so this actually nominally is 3D, but it's intrinsic dimensionality is 2D. There's these symmetries within the system that S plus I plus TI1 equals N, which mean that really it's only a two dimensional system. There's only two degrees of freedom. All you can do is, is you specify I and S and you, it, it, it tells you what TI1 must be. There's no choice in the matter. Um, and in general, we can have quite some difference between the, impl the intrinsic and the nominal dimensionality. And you see this a lot in agent-based models because nominally, agent-based model is huge dimension. But in point of fact, because of the dynamics on it, the coupling between agents, it's not gonna exercise all those degrees of freedom. Just like this sheet of paper is nominally in three space but it's effectively a two-dimensional object. It's going to be a it's going to be sort of moving around on a a, a thin section of this overall uh, state space. Uh, this intrinsic dimensionality is much lower. Often we show these things with what are called flow lines, and the flow lines can be drawn by identifying s dot and i dot. So here we have s and i, for example, and we draw an, sort of an arrow in that. Um, you know, in it with a with a slope um, as given by those values of s dot and i dot, and so you know a, a value of, of these sort of pointing upwards here would indicate if the system is in this point. Think about like a drop of water in the Canadian Rockies it will roll down in one direction towards the Arctic Ocean, or one direction towards the Pacific Ocean, or one direction towards Hudson Bay. And, uh, and it will roll down and it will follow these flow lines. So, so here, if we have a certain value of S, say 198, and a certain value of I, say 1500, it will sort of end up going in this direction. What's this direction? Well, it means lessening the value of S, it's going left, and it means increasing the value of infective. So more and more people get infected and you could see it starts trending kind of more steeply. So a diagram like this with these flow lines kind of shows you how the system's kind of um, propensity to move. It's, it's kind of um, tendency to move in, in all different possibilities. And you can see here, there's different basins of attraction. If we had just been a bit higher, it would have gone up this way. But because we were here, we went down and, and recovered. Um, and you can get, the slight differences whereby, okay, I you know, mumble, I didn't pair this with the right diagram, or if you set it off just a little bit differently, it'll go up and otherwise it'll go down. Um, okay, um, this, actually, this actually is dying out and going down, whereas this one's taking off, uh, I think, um, um, mumble, in any case. Um, Okay, uh, so we talked about that. Let's talk about network types. Um, time is a, a ticking here. Okay, so we talked about a set of network types um, uh, and I expect you'd be familiar with these. One of them was called variously Poisson random. It's any logics term for it and it's a common term. 
It's also called Bernoulli. Um, it's also called um, uh, Erdos, um, an Erdos random network, uh, Erdos random network. I won't sort of put the umlaut in. But, um, and, and this has global structure. There's basically two people are connected with equal probability regardless if they have neighbors in common and there's no sense of ordering, no sense of this person is, is you know, a neighbor of that one or, or has already, they have connections in common, so they probably know each other too. Um, you know, person A and B, maybe they each have friends in common. And so they're more likely to be connected themselves. No, 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 that's just any two pairs of people have an equal probability of being connected. Um, there's this thing called the ring lattice network, uh, which was kind of the extreme where someone's connection is totally dictated by their position. They're connected with a certain number of people in their left and right, and they're in a certain ordering. So they have purely local connection. Um, so this is you know purely purely 1D local connections. A distance based would be uh, 2D local connections. Uh, and these really constrain how the infection can spread. You may remember it dying out for those, for example, in my video that I made in that, in that lecture. You can go back and watch it if you'd like. Um, now, uh, so this is very local. This is very global. And researchers uh, a few decades ago, um, I think it was in the 90s probably, um, maybe it was early 2000s, identified that you know, human networks are kind of a combination of them. They have some, a lot of local, but they have some global as well. Um, maybe we know, maybe we interact mostly with our neighbors and people nearby us and people who are in similar age and structure, but we know some people who are, are further out. And one of the formulations is a very simple formulation of this is called a small world network. This is like a certain fraction local, typically most of it, and then a small fraction typically of of the rest of it is is global is is random, so we kind of hitch people up to the neighbors and then we rewire randomly through an arbitrary other person across the network of uh, some of those connections. We rewire them, just a fraction of the connections, maybe at five percent or something. Um, that's a small world network, and that can lead to behavior. It's actually quite similar to a global one, even if only five percent of its connections are global it allows the infection to leap across from one area to the other, you know, jump across from one country to another, jump from one city to another in ways that would otherwise just creep outwards if it were purely local. Scale-free networks are, um, are a type of network we discuss in detail and I'll get to that in a minute, but which are distinguished by having very, um, uh, very diverse, great disparities in the number of connections. Most people have few connections, but some people have tons and tons of connections. So scale-free networks, um, we have, if we consider the probability of having K connections as being P of K, um, regardless of value of K, whether we're dealing with comparing people with two connections versus one, that ratio of probability of having two connections compared to the probability of having one, it's the same as probably of having, if we consider K equals 100, 200 connections versus 100 connections. Um, so regardless how far we look out, we, we get that same kind of proportionate um, ratio um, far out. And, and, and technically what this is going to is a, a probability of having K connections proportional to there's some constant there, but proportional to K, the number of connections to the minus gamma of two. So this might be K to the minus two, which would mean one over K squared, or maybe gamma is three, which is one over K cubed, one over K times K times K. Um, uh, and, and that leads to what's called a very heavy tail. It's like, you can go out really far and still find some people out there, you know, 2000 connections, um, for example. Um, and if you plot it out on a, on a plot, you can plot down here log k, logarithm k, and you 
plot it with uh, probability of having that many connections, you get exactly this. Um, just follows that with the math, taking the logarithm of this. And, you know, uh, it's on the log log plot, it's a straight line. This leads to being just, a t you know, most, most, most people have very few connections, but there's some people have a ton, and those people are super important. Why? Mark my words, because they have undue influence. Why do they have undue influence? Well, regardless of whether we're talking about spread of pathogens, spread of rumors on, you know, um, by gossip, spread of, of conspiracy theories, whatever, those people with tons of connections are more likely, they're like a magnet for getting affected by those things, magnet for infections. You're meeting a thousand people a day, you know, even a very small prevalence, you're, you're likely to get exposed to it. Um, but once you get it, you're more likely to pass it on because you could disseminate to thousands of people. So, so here, um, you know, they're kind of these perfect super spreaders. Um, they're more likely to get infected, more likely to pass it on. Um, and one of the things we showed is that, you know, while our infectious disease models traditionally um, had these nice equations, which took into account the average number of people that a given susceptible meets per day, um, it turns out that it, what you really want to consider is not all susceptible is the same. And it's not just the average across the population that matters. The people who have lots and lots of connections tend to be the people who get infected. And, and the people with lots and lots of connections tend to be people who pass it on. So if you look at the average here, you're fooling yourself. You have to take into account. You have to take into account the variability. Um, you have to take into account there's some that a disproportionate number of infections are taking place between people of tons and tons of connections. So, um, so that's something that came up in the context of networks. And with those comments, ladies and gentlemen, I will, uh, I conclude my, my uh, pre-prepared material and I would gladly answer questions here for the balance of our time together. So what questions could I answer? I went through a whirlwind tour of what I consider most salient features of a bunch of areas of the material that we covered. Uh, topics that I consider highly susceptible to be on the exam, as it were. Um, but um, what, uh, what questions could I answer for you here? The floor is open. Oh, good. Question not related to the exam um, but, uh, or what was covered. Uh, ETA on RK. Um, when quizzes two through four and take home exercise number two uh, will be released. Um, yeah, I my understanding was that two and three quizzes were done a, a while back again. Um, I will have to check on why those haven't already been released. I know I asked them to go over them carefully uh, one by one instead of relying on on the auto answers for some, but that shouldn't that shouldn't um, delay it till this point. Uh, take home exercise one. Um, that could have been an oversight on my part um, in terms of assigning it explicitly to one of the TAs. Uh, I appreciate you bringing that forward. I will screenshot this, and I will write the TAs right after this to make sure those. Are available as early as possible this coming week. So thank you for bringing that up. I hadn't been aware of that uh, uh, that oversight. Great. Other questions? Oh, 
Oh, it says the quizzes are marked, but the marks aren't visible. Oh, oh that's really appreciated. Um, hmm. Okay, that sounds like something that um, that I didn't think was required, but it's, it's probably something I have to do. I probably have to frob some setting for those that I'm not familiar with. So that's even more helpful. I might not even, for the quizzes, I might not have to contact the TA. So I'll, uh, I appreciate the pointer on that. And um, if that's the case, hopefully I can get you some of these released uh, forthwith. So much appreciated. Thank you, Anna. Questions? What about participation mark? Uh, yeah, so so uh, Zhongwei, you had asked about this uh, three days ago. Uh, I've not computed it. I'm currently on vacation and uh, I don't think I'm going to compute it uh, too many hours prior to the final exam, um, but I may do it early on the 26th. Uh, what you had asked a few days ago is whether it would be uh, in uh, released in Moodle and I had indicated in the affirmative I did not promise that it would necessarily be available before the final exam. Uh, given that I'm on vacation, I have been on vacation since late Friday and remain on it. I am not overly desirous to spend my time um, computing those, uh, those participation marks before uh, my return on the 26th. I hope you and others would appreciate that. I do do those myself. Others, other questions? So it is my plan to deliver a second such review session for those unable to make this one or for, um, for asking question by those who could make this session um, um, so that you can, um, you can have a chance to ask additional questions. Um, I think we, I spent a while preparing these materials uh, today and um, my thought is that maybe we use a, a somewhat different format for the second session after all. Hopefully, and assuming that people can review the, uh, the videos for this session, I have to ensure that those are preserved. Um, uh, I'll think about that a little bit. Um, uh, time is tricky because as I noted, I'm currently on holiday and um, Ideally, I'd like to give that after I'm back, but that puts us uh, uh, on the day of the exam itself. So I'm going to have to uh, do some, uh, I'm going to have some figuring to do. And uh, I may actually ask you to undertake a, um, a, a poll, which would, um, which would uh, allow me to, to understand the degree to which some people are unable to make this session who would who would come to the other session. For example, maybe there's uh, um, imminent finals that people are, are um, you know, batting down the hatches studying for now, which will be passed for the second session that will allow some people to attend that couldn't tonight. Um, in any case, so I, I'm gonna try to figure out uh, how to do that. Uh, if I can, I will offer that uh, second uh, session um, before the, uh, the day of the, uh, the exam, okay? Um, I am uh, once again though, emphasizing my willingness to uh, answer additional questions right now. Mm. Uh, okay, uh, there's a question that's come in. Do we need to show all the steps of calculating the equilibrium points, uh, um, other mathematical problems, or just the final answer? Definitely, 
definitely, definitely, um, I'm going to ask you to show the steps. Um, it is both um, rather unhelpful and rather risky to um, to only show the final answer, um, especially because it's fragile. Uh, if the answer is wrong, um, I I don't know uh, what credit to give. So. In the question on the final exam is my recollection. I ask you specifically to show all the steps and you are required to show the steps. Um, and uh, that will uh, help me figure out just how much uh, you got right and where you went off. Uh, and, and so, yes, uh, you are required to, to walk through steps, yeah. And in general, you know, when you're answering things, including true false questions, including fill in the blank, um, you know, it, it's a good idea to consider supplementing it with some of your thinking. Um, there are times where I will give an incorrect answer full credit because it's undertaken at a level of subtlety in thinking that wasn't intended or required. Um, but you know, it reflects a deeper level of understanding um, that uh, nominally you could have said this, but you, you realize there's actually this, this tricky aspect of the situation. And I've been known to give full credit for that. Um, so I would urge you to consider um, you know, lending answers some supplemental information so that they could be, uh, could be given appropriate, um, appropriate credit for those uh, answers. Hope that's helpful. So those are good questions. Other questions? Questions? Do you, do you think there might be any questions um, that sort of might reference models that we reviewed um, and ask us to kind of um, integrate thoughts about that model into our answer or, yeah. <laughs> mm. I mean, like, like the models that we reviewed in class? Yeah. Yeah. Um, as part of the examples. Yeah, oh yeah, so, so there are. So thank you for the question. It's, um, um, I wouldn't expect it to be a, a dominant uh, theme, but um, uh, I'll give you, an, you know, a, a few examples of this. Um, um, this would often be, you know, in, in sort of a small, smaller number of areas, I think. But for example, in the hybrid, I didn't include slides tonight on uh, hybrid uh, models, but I, sh I showed a number of compelling examples there. Uh, case in point, the budding model where people are turned into agents, right? At a certain point of their progression, they, they go down a flow and lo and behold, they're created as agents and decremented from the stock, created as agents in an agent-based model. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's an example. Um, there was an environmental contamination one um, where, you know, you could have um, contamination in the environment that might cause infection. And um, uh, I think, you know, I'd, I'd expect you to be aware of what could be done there. I, I, um, I wouldn't be intending to test you on, you know, what did that model give or, you know, how many clinics did we need if we if to prevent the, the outbreak from occurring at the get-go versus how many do we need if we you know, want to squelch it, nothing like that. But, um, um, 
certainly like some of the take home messages from those would be important. Like, oh, you can do that. Or there's this lock-in effect. And if you, if you try to head it off, you know, through prevention from the start, you can do so with very, very little resource, few resources, very small amounts of resources. But if you try to do it after the fact, after it's established, it takes massive amounts of more effort to bring it under control. Now that's a, a point worth taking home. And um, that was imparted by a model. Um, I wouldn't be asking you, you know, what did that model include or anything like that? It would be, you know, it would be sort of, um, What's a take home message from it? Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's, um, that's about the level at which I'd ask something like that. Does that help? Yeah, sounds good, thank you. Yeah. Additional questions? Time is approaching 8.20. Um, my, th my throat is fairly raw. Um, my uh, energy is uh, not uh, what it normally is, uh, partly because of the vaccination. Um, and I'm, I'm flagging a bit, but I will take one or two more questions here if, if there's uh, any people want to bring up in the next minute or two. Okay, it doesn't sound like people are bringing them forward. I uh, hope this session is useful. I'm hoping that the recordings um, of all sections of it will be captured appropriately. Um, uh, but uh, uh, hopefully in any case, it will have imparted uh, some understanding both of what could be expected, uh, some refreshing of memory on the, uh, the exam and uh, some appreciation for, um, for you know some aspects of, of the lessons learned that might extend even some of your original thinking. Um, uh, I, I know it's a difficult week uh, with, with uh, exams likely for many of you, but um, hope this will uh, allay a little bit some of the fears about it. I would encourage you to consider watching some of my review sessions for previous years for this course, which you'll find on, on um, um, online, uh, which also have relevant material and explanations, although some of them have uh, bits of material that weren't covered this year. And this certainly included some material that wasn't covered those years. Uh, but, you know, if you found it useful, you may find some of those others as well. Uh, I'm, I am hoping to have this other session um, within uh, a week's time, but um, we'll uh, see how that uh, situation goes and, and uh, I may do a, a doodle poll or what have you. So thank you very much. Best of luck uh, in studying, uh, stay safe. And uh, I look forward to seeing you hopefully prior to the exam. Thanks very much and good luck with all your studies. Take care of that. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, um, I, it hasn't been too bad. Uh, the, the shots aren't too bad, but they are. Um, um, the second one was worse. It is going to be worse, and it's uh, even this one. Yeah, you feel it. You feel it. So, okay. Take care of that. Stay safe. Good luck with you.